So uh, how's the test going to go? Well, that's I'm going to talk about tonight. That's after the break. Everyone will be able to ask any questions. First, I'll explain it, show you how the test looks, literally have a copy of what it'll look like that you can take a screenshot or just, just you know, look at it while I describe it. And I'll take all the questions you have. So I'm sure by the end of tonight, you'll, you'll understand. I can tell you one thing to make you all less stressed out. It's an open book test and you will have actually, if you count the amount of time from when I show the slides on the Zoom class and then post them for 48 more hours, you'll actually have almost 70, well, you know, two and a half, three days to, to work on it. And you're at home and your notes, obviously it's an open book test. So, so it shouldn't be too difficult as long as you took good notes and you know, you have them with you when uh, we, we do the test. I'll explain all that. Okay. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, well, a handful of notes I took are pretty much, well, I wrote down fewer than, than I should, but, but most of them I wrote down as most as I could. Well, then you should be okay, but don't forget you can go back and watch, everybody can go back and watch all of the lectures, including the one that we had last week as a makeup. For some of you who joined us just now, you might not have noticed I sent an email saying I was posting. It was a little later than usual because I had a bit of a problem with my daughter's uh, school counselors. They were acting like uh, incompetence and we had to really wrestle with her graduation <clears throat> requirements. And, you know, it's the end of a senior year's high school. So I had to deal with all that by email and, and voicemail. So I sent it about 1130. That is on Friday. So if you didn't see it, the lecture that was canceled or, or postponed, really rescheduled. Uh, I know you did, Luis, obviously. Uh, that's all on uh, YouTube now. OK, and you can just watch that and any other lecture from any other class that you might want to review. That's that's the easiest way to review for the exam. Okay, we got a couple more people wanting to join. Hang on. Welcome. We're just getting started. Okay, and I have. Um, oh, okay. One more person there. I have uh, enabled the chat function. I figured out how with some help from the. I must say the tech people are getting much better at returning calls and they did and it took an, only about a half hour to figure out what was wrong and go over the process so it shouldn't happen again so that if you want to you send a question to your fellow or comment or observation to your fellow students uh, you can do that now on the chat function I still prefer when you ask me a question that you do it like we are doing now you know live uh, or, uh, verbally Okay, because it's quicker and easier for me to answer. But either way, I will check the, the chat from time to time. And during the break, I always see if there's questions that have been uh, stored there and answer them after the break. Okay, so here we go. We have three uh, major tasks tonight. The first one will be in just a few minutes when we start the slides to finish to complete Baroque art. And Rembrandt is such an important artist you definitely want to take good notes on his, I think it's two slides of his works. Um, so, but that should uh, probably we'd be able to finish by the normal break time, which is eight. If we don't, the most we'd have is one or two more slides after the break, but you definitely want to stay for the second half because after the break, as I was just telling uh, Luis and everyone else, you're going to get all the details about how the test is going to be given. There's one more, welcome. You're going to get all the details after the break on how to study for the test and uh, what to do, uh, you know, when the test is on the screen a week from tonight is the midterm. But it isn't one of those do or die where if you don't finish it or whatever you've finished by the end of the class, you have to submit it to me. You'll have another three days before the test needs to be sent to me to be on time. And that gives you guys plenty of time. It'll be posted on YouTube uh, Thursday, Friday, and most of Saturday. I, I will send you an email about this too. But the point is, you, you should be here to take the test in real time because then it gives you a head start. And in case you can't be, you still can take the test by watching it in you know the same exact set of slides and everything uh, from the recording on YouTube. And that's also how, if some of you had just joined us, it's how you can do your review. But let's let's talk about the test after the break, because that's how I scheduled this uh, this session. We want to finish with the um, 
Baroque slides, but we have one other task tonight. I already did this, but I'll do it again. I think it's a third time, but I don't think there's anything wrong with repeating some of the information for everyone's sake. If you didn't already know, this is how your paper should be labeled when you turn it in. The deadline, I'm giving you guys a little bit of an extension, is till midnight tonight for it not to have points off for being late. And I put an email to everyone for that. Both classes that I teach have that same extra little time. So if you didn't finish it and you can get it done by tonight and send it to me like this as a PDF, please, and only to, I've said it so many times, but I keep repeating it, my AOL account. It's just much easier to navigate for me and the readers. So it's uh, obviously art 1.2, short paper, number one, underline, last name, comma, first name. Uh, let's see, is there a question? I'm looking, I don't see in the chat category yet. Is there a lot, any questions about the papers? Let's uh, focus on the test and questions about it after the break. Any questions about your papers? I think everyone's clear on what, what the requirements are. And uh, remember, you do have to attach the cover sheet that is also a PDF. Uh, and it uh, looks like at least one more person wants to. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there we go. OK, Tom, you know, we get, just got joined. But yeah, we were just yeah. saying that the papers are due by midnight. Um, so you can uh, you take a little longer if you need to. Uh, my goal is to get started grading them on Thursday because I also teach tomorrow, so I won't be able to do it Wednesday. But I can't promise when I'm going to get them back. It, I used to promise when it was a live in-person format. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I would uh, say that I could. There we go. One more. <laughs> All right. Annabelle. Yeah. Okay. Now, I didn't mute anybody, but sometimes it does that kind of off on its own. Is is there anybody who wants to ask a question orally that is not able to? I think it's self-muting is what uh, um, has to unmute. Well, <laughs> I, I, I know the chat function is, is preferable for some of you, but it's really faster if you just ask me live. Okay, well, here we go. So you see that that is the same thing. I've held it up now three times. You all should have had a chance if you just joined us to double check that you label your files as PDFs with the attachment, uh, the cover sheet, I'm sorry, as an attachment. And that way it can be graded in a single file, a PDF file at, uh, sent to me at my AOL account. Again, it's M-A-R-K-W at AOL.com. So let's get started with the slides now, unless there's any other urgent questions from the people who just joined us about the, um, <clears throat> Papers, just the papers. Okay, I'm going to, let's see, I want to get rid of this here. Uh, I can't quite tell if that's what that will do. I don't, I'm, I'm a little leery of these. The, the format has changed somewhat and the people at tech, uh, the tech support office said, yeah, there are some things that are not as clear or different than they used to be. So if I hit, you know, something wrong, we might lose the meeting. I don't want to. So I guess we just go ahead with the screen share now. So the next must know slide is what we're going to be talking about. And let me get it. Yeah, here we go. That's how I can get it. There we go. Okay. And get this. <coughs> okay. And move this up. All right. Um, I'm going to give you the title of the first must know. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Yeah, good. It's important because, yeah, yeah you, sometimes that happens, as, as you may have noticed uh, in other classes. So far this semester, knock on wood, not in this class. Okay. We're on week six. So we, we have less slides than we did last week. So let's try to do them, if possible, all before the break. But if not, we'll finish up the last one or two at, right at the uh, start of the second half and then go right in to reviewing. Uh, as long as you have questions, I'll stick around uh, the tests and how to uh, take it, how to uh, study for it. OK, the first must know slide. Uh, for tonight is this one, Charles the First. And if you recall, when you talk about rulers like kings and things, always they have Roman numerals for the which what it is. Charles, it's Roman numeral one, so it's like the letter I, right? Charles the First is the title. 
the artist's name, it's uh, he's Dutch. So many Dutch people had two word last names. So his is capital V-A-N, second word capital D-Y-C-K. Okay, Van Dyke, 1635. A heads up, uh, the de Young just reopened or will be. There's an option for extra credit. In the de Young, there is one room that is really specially high quality. It has two Van Dyke portraits, not this one. This one's worth even more money than the ones in San Francisco, but it has two good portraits by Van Dyke. And it has a Rembrandt and a Rubens. So that room, sort of it's basically a, a Baroque painting uh, section of the museum is well worth the trip there alone. But plus, of course, they have special exhibits all the time. So check, you know, on the website, whatever, you know, on Google, if you don't already know how to get in touch with the, um, uh, the de Young, which as you may know, is the closest uh, museum. Uh, actually, you know, it is, it's in Golden Gate Park. So but you can check in that and, and find out on your own if you, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's at the Palace of Fine Arts. Both museums are reopening. The Palace of Fine Arts has the four high-end Baroque paintings. Again, two Van Dykes, one Rubens, and one Rembrandt, all in one room. All right, so who was Van Dyke? Now you should start taking notes. Van Dyke was considered to be the greatest, and certainly he was the most successful portrait painter of the um, early 17th century. I'll say it again. Uh, uh, Van Dyck was the um, most successful and many consider the greatest portrait painter of the early 1600s or 17th century, obviously. I think everyone knows by now <laughs> that 1600s means 17th century. All right, so we're looking at one of his most famous portraits, maybe the most important painting he ever did because it's of the King of England. And if you don't know who he was, that's really the important part of the meaning that you want to put down in your notes. This, this man was the King of England at a time when kings believed in the quote, divine right of kings. That's an actual phrase that was used in England and of course in other countries, different languages to describe the attitude that kings had toward their subjects, meaning, you have no right to question me. That's one way to put it. Uh, we've seen attitudes like that, haven't we, in different parts of the world and maybe even closer to home not so long ago. Anyway, the point is the attitude that they, they could do no wrong. And, and everything they did was like God's, you know, will. So you couldn't question them. So divine meant God, right? So God made them king. And therefore, everything they wanted, they should get. Everything they ordered their people to do, they should unquestioningly, without question or protest, just follow the king's wishes. Well, you know, by the time this guy came along, that theory was being challenged, the divine right of kings, by a large number of educated people in England, one of whom was named Cromwell. And if you don't know who he was, you probably should write one line about him because it's an important part of the meaning. Cromwell led a rebellion against this king. It was called the English Civil War, but it was more like a rebellion, which not only did this king get overthrown, he's the first one by his own people, that is by popular rebellion in his own kingdom in England, uh, which was led by Cromwell, um, but he also was the first king to be executed by his own people. Now, how did that happen? So that's the other part of the meaning. Well, let's start with his arrogance. Look at his attitude. Can you see by the way he's standing and the way his pose, you know, and his uh, expression and his face that he thinks he's quite literally God's agent on earth, right? That God made him king and no one should ever question him. So he had an arrogant attitude and he refused to even talk to the people who wanted reforms. They refused to discuss any kind of change or, you know, any voice for the uh, average or you know middle class is what they were people that that were angry with his uh, attitude of being so arrogant and believing he he could do no wrong and they had no rights that he had to respect so his attitude was part of the problem his belief in that theory I just I'll say it again the divine right of kings was 
why he acted that way. And then on top of that, we had that he was Catholic. At that point in English history, majority of uh, English people had become Protestant. So those things were three strikes against him. So he lost the rebellion. You should write the right phrase. It's, it's the right way. Historians say the English Civil War, which it really was a civil war between the um, more common middle class and upper middle class, right, uh, professional people uh, under Cromwell. And they defeated him in battle. And then the last thing, how did he lose his head? He was given the right to leave England after he lost the first uh, round of the Civil War. It went on for years, you know, three or four years. So he lost. And the, the English, uh, vic the victors, Cromwell, right, that the, they had taken over and removed him from the throne, said, OK, you can take your family and your personal belongings and go in safely to wherever, France or wherever you want, another country. He did briefly, and then he came back and started trying to take back his throne. And the second time he was defeated, he was tried for treason found guilty and beheaded in front of a crowd of 1 million people. Now, this is in the 1640s, this happened, not long after this painting. So he actually uh, brought his own you know, death on himself in the way most historians would look at it. He was, he was clueless. You could say it that way if you want to, if, if you were writing about this. I'm not saying it will be on the midterm. Uh, tonight, there's only, I think it's two slides that are so important that I won't cut them from the list. And uh, for sure, when we do the, which we're gonna do right after the break, that's one of the reasons you wanna be here. So you know which slides I'm removing 40% of them. So you don't even have to think about those. We'll do that right after the uh, last slide. Okay, but this is one I'm not saying I might or might not remove, but anyway, it's an important slide because uh, who, uh, painting I should say, because of uh, who Van Dyck was. And he was the royal, I forgot to mention one last fact. He was the royal court, or just they said court painter. He painted not courtrooms, but the royal court. So royal court is probably a safer way. In other words, he was at the beck and call of the king to paint his portrait whenever he wanted. That's how he made a lot of his income. Uh, that is Van Dyck. And he went all over Europe painting other people, other kings and other royal people. But for a long time, right about the time of this painting, 1636, he was living in the palace. And he, the king was making him his family portraiture, a portrait painter, I'm sorry. Please, question. I hear someone question. He was the royal what? Court, you know, as in with a capital C, painter. You could just say royal painter, but that's not, that doesn't quite make it clear. In other words, he lived in the court, in the palace. Well, there were so many palaces. <laughs> he probably moved around, you know, the kings of England to now, you know this, right? The, well, she's a queen, Queen Elizabeth, and all of their family. You have about 18 different palaces <laughs> all over the British house. But at some point, he would have lived in the main palace uh, with the king and his family. He had his own, you know, of course, a studio and an apartment and a bunch of assistants and all the money he needed to buy the paint. You know, in other words, he was on retainer. You know that phrase, re on retainer. <laughs> uh, but for several years, he lived in, in the royal court, the royal, pa you could say royal palace if you want, uh, with the king's family. And every time the king asked him to come paint him, he that was his job. He had to. So this day, we'll end up this with a, an interesting observation. Now we're gonna finish up the meaning with one last little detail, then we'll do a formal analysis. Do you notice these two footmen? This one that looks like a young Charlie Watts, the drummer for the Rolling Stones, <laughs> very much like that, having seen the Rolling Stones up close twice. Anyway, and then this guy here, these are two servants, of course. They're not allowed to look in his direction. He can look at us and say, aren't I God's, you know, chosen agent, don't you acknowledge? It's almost like he's telling us to accept that he's the most powerful man in you know, Great Britain. Uh, okay, or well, at that time it was England. And then, so these two are literally, the painter is making a statement, is my point. A subtle statement, a slightly satirical statement. I would say that somewhat or slightly, subtly, there's even better words, subtly satirical statement. There's your alliteration. With the fact that he's showing these two servants as having to look away because the king is so magnificent, they dare not even glance in his direction. But my favorite detail is the horse. 
his own horse has to look away from his his own his own horse to look down at the ground. It's just, if if you notice these details and many other people who would see this painting when they came to the royal palace because that's where it was would get that little bit of a diss, just a slight diss that the painter is, because he probably felt this man was an arrogant ass, which he was. <laughs> um, obviously, history bears that out. <clears throat> so what you see is, you know, all three other living creatures in the painting have to look away because he's so magnificent. They can't even glance in his direction. Okay, formal analysis. I call it balanced, although this is sky, but clouds have mass and volume. So it seems roughly equal to the area here of the upper tree branches. Um, but on the other hand, if you drew the line just down here, then it's you, you decide it, because he is the largest single figure, obviously, because you don't see the other's full bodies. Uh, you could make the case that it's weighted, but I think it's roughly balanced left to right and top to bottom if you draw the line down here. But there are people who would say no, because it's a solid ground below and if the sky doesn't count as volume in your mind, that's fine. Then you could say it's unbalanced toward the bottom. Uh, it is almost entirely stable. Look carefully, because even though his hat is round and the top of this guy, these two guys' heads are somewhat round, the horse, look, is almost in a, a straight up and down, you know, uh, pose with his neck and his head, because he's looking at the ground like, you know, a good obedient horse. And then this, obviously the king is standing totally straight upright. Uh, and the tree trunk is close to, so it's more stable than dynamic, but of course, with some dynamic details. Simulated texture, well, of course, it's a Baroque painting, which is sort of like the last phase, some would call it late uh, Renaissance. And that clearly shows in the realistic detail on the clothing. I mean, you can tell that that's, you know, uh, sort of velvet, actually you can't quite tell, but that's what they, he would have worn, kid leather boots, satin jacket, obviously he's poor, he has all the money in the world to buy the fanciest clothes in, in uh, the British Isles, right? And then of course, uh, the texture on the horse's mane, on the tree uh, branches, on the path, uh, you know, with the plants, all, all of it's sharp and realistic as is the modeling. And then we have space. It's got all the main techniques. This is atmospheric perspective. See a blue hazy look back there. There's clearly a vanishing point behind that tree probably or somewhere behind him. Uh, so it has scientific perspective. Overlapping, the path is, has foreshortening uh, as you look down the, around the edge of it. Uh, and then of course, diminishing size on some of the plants. So it's got the five main techniques for realistic depiction of space. The largest mass, it's a close call, but probably the king, then his horse, uh, at, or maybe the tree. And uh, I'd say that's, they're almost equal. And then I guess third or fourth could be this, the closest footman. So you see most of his body. The colors are warm on, uh, of course, the, the horse's mane and these two footmen, but uh, and only uh, the pants here or uh, <clears throat> leggings, if you want to call them that, of the king are warm, otherwise he's wearing, well, his boots are too, so it's a lower part of his body is. Uh, and obviously all three of these uh, people's faces and hair is considered warm. Okay, uh, and the line is all thin, okay. Um, and the rhythm is obviously human bodies, of course, repeated shapes, uh, arms, hands, legs, and so forth, okay. Now, the next must know is by a man I admire greatly. And I bet most of you've never heard of, unless you've been to Holland. <clears throat> His name was Halls. The actual must know is this one, but I'm gonna talk about who Halls was because just like I will with Rembrandt and I did with some other previous painters, it's so important to have context as part of the meaning of the must know slides when the artist is so influential that, you know, they're one of the most famous and, and uh, important artists of their time. I usually give you more than one slide about those artists. And this is one of them. Um, the must know is, I'll give you the title first. So you have it ready to take notes here. Uh, and this is the must know for the next one. La Bohemienne, two words. Some of you may know the uh, uh, movie version or even the actual play version of Rent, right? Which is really pretty well done intensely emotional story about New York, right? <clears throat> uh, tenants struggling with poverty and everything else, AIDS and so forth. 
La Bohemienne is actually the title of a song from that play. Uh, La L.A. and then second word, capital B-O-H-E-M-I-E-N-N-E, -E -E, La Bohemienne. The artist's last name is Halls, H-A-L-S, not like the word Halls, but the spelling, Dutch spelling has one L. Halls, 1636. So what we see here is a woman who was dispossessed by society or abandoned. But let's start out with who was Halls. Okay, so now you should be taking notes because this is another Halls painting. And I took this slide, the last, uh, sorry, the, the, the must know is from the slide library. But why I mention that is I couldn't believe when I looked at this, it's at the uh, National Gallery, you'll have to write that, in Washington, D.C., uh, the story behind it. And this is typical of Halls. So here's what you should write. Halls was a very successful portrait painter, but different than almost every other portrait painter of his era, except Rembrandt. So that means he and Rembrandt were the unique ones. We'll say why Rembrandt was uh, in just a few minutes when you get to the Rembrandt must. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you repeat that, please? Sure. Rembrandt and this guy, Halls, the man who painted this one and the next slide, were the two most unusual portrait painters in Europe at the time. Why? Here's why. So it's what you should write. Because they chose to paint the underclass, the dispossessed, you know, that's actually a title of Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, people that were rejected by society. Now, later on, that got to be common in the 1800s with people like toulouse lautrec You know that, some of you, right? But not in the 1600s. You were trying to earn a living painting portraits, so you weren't going to paint poor people with no money just because you wanted to capture their personality or show how they dealt with their poverty or their discrimination. So I'll say it again. Halls was one of only two famous. you got to say famous. There were probably other painters we don't know about. So once again, Halls, this guy, and Rembrandt were the two most famous painters of uh, the early, just say 17th century, 1600s, right, or 17th century, uh, who spent much of their career, that's, it's not their whole career, of course, but much of their career painting people who were the underclass. Dispossessed is a phrase that I'd prefer, but I don't know if that word means the same thing to all of you. You know, people that were abandoned, ignored or oppressed by society. And that's very unusual because they didn't get paid for this. In fact, they probably paid the people that posed to give them a little income so they had something to live on for a month or two. This guy, for instance, was a veteran of wars uh, that the Dutch army had, of course, probably forced to go fight. I don't know if they had a draft. Anyway, let's just say he would fought for his country. And now he's singing for a living. It's called the Jolly Trooper. You see, if you look carefully, you can see his title down there from where I took it. See, the Jolly Trooper. And this guy had to play the fool to entertain rich people or even just you know, middle class and people with enough money to throw coins at him. In other words, you'd think he was humiliating himself, right? If you think of it that way, he, Harry was a soldier, maybe even an officer. Then he gets out of the army and he, you know, he doesn't have any skills. Apparently he's unemployed. He's living, you know, on um, begging for, for money by singing and sing, making silly songs and maybe even silly poetry and reciting in front of strangers. That could be considered humiliating, but look at his face. This is what Halls did that Rembrandt also did. He's not feeling like he's being, you know, made a fool of. He's decided he's going to make the best of it and he's going to enjoy. And he might even have made fun of some of the audience that he was singing for. We don't know because we don't know that he wasn't famous. There's nobody famous here. Just another one of these poor people wandering around from end to end, you know, uh, all over Holland, probably not just in one city trying to make a living by begging, but he was performing for his, his, his supper in essence. But he did not think of himself as being, um, you know, somehow uh, uh, society's reject. He decided to, to actually enjoy that process and be creative. Okay, so the La Boheme 
is even more intense example. This is the must know now, everybody understand that. If there's either one of these, on the, uh, it would only be this one, if there's a Franz Hall slide. It's the only must know by him. So what do we have? We have a woman who most historians believe was one of three things, or maybe all three, when he painted her. She's a young woman who was uh, single. There's some evidence for that, I don't know all the details. And he saw her in some kind of a dive bar, maybe working as a, you know, a server, a scrub, or maybe all of the above, scrub woman, a cook, or some combination. She was probably either abandoned by, you know, uh, maybe because she was mentally ill or, or ill, uh, or had some falling out with her family, or she could have been abused and escaped. That's my guess, is an, an abusing relationship, or abusive, I should say, uh, you know, husband or some other, you know, care, uh, quote unquote, you know, uh, partner who was supposed to be her support and instead of course women rarely were allowed to have their own careers then except in low paying jobs like this so she would have been really looked down on the rest of the society at the time wherever she went would think of that poor you know uh, loser that poor lost soul but look at her face again it may be because she's in internalized everything and she's you know got her own sense of what reality is if she is we don't know that because we had have any proof that she was either you know perhaps bipolar or something like that they didn't even have that concept back then but maybe not maybe she just had a hard past but now she's decided to not again let it get her down not to let it defeat her and he Halls, the painter admire people like that and no one else was painting them except Rembrandt they were friends, by the way. Halls and Rembrandt respected each other greatly. I think they met like once or twice. Anyway, they knew about each other. Uh, they lived in different cities, but they, they both were famous Dutch painters who chose to focus not all, not even maybe half, but a lot of their paintings or, or their career on the poor, uh, the unfortunate, uh, the dispossessed of society at that time. And they didn't make money from that. That wasn't the point. They just wanted to capture the reality of urban life. And we are talking about urban life now. These are people in the big cities of Holland. <clears throat> the the uh, last guy, you know, and this woman. Okay, that's pretty much the whole meaning here. Formal analysis. Wait, hold on. Uh, sure. Wait, right. That's it? That's Good. plenty. <laughs> it gives you, it's probably about two pages worth of notes. Well, no, page of notes. Can you uh, there I can do the formal summaries. Pardon? What? You have a specific question, Louise? Right. Uh, well, I wrote okay. down Hales and Rembrandt were two of the most unusual painters yes. for evoking the underclass and shows a woman. Okay, you don't have to read us the whole thing. Working as a cook with abandon and. Okay, but you don't have to, to read us the whole notes. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to keep moving. So yeah, that's all I wrote you, down. You know what? If you missed anything, I said this at the start. I, I I don't know if you didn't catch it. For everybody, you can always go back and watch the recording and add the notes and pause it. Okay, because we need right. to keep moving. We need to keep moving. Sorry. All right, formal analysis. Uh, there's only one mass here. Her right. And the only technique for space is overlapping. Some people think they see foreshortening on her shoulder. Maybe, I don't really, but if you do, you could say, well, okay, maybe a little bit of foreshortening and overlapping of her clothes and hair over her body. <coughs> now, it is very advanced in you, when you talk about the modeling, look at this, her blouse and the dress, right? That you know has just these two uh, reddish straps over the top of the shoulders. Those are painted almost in impressionistic style. They are very diffused. Remember that word. It's a good word to use. You, you'll hear it a lot between now and the final exam, right? With an I, diffused means or soft. You could say soft, simulated texture and modeling, both in this painting, are soft and diffused, except on her face. There, it's a little bit more realistic, right? A little sharper. But even there, it's not as sharp, as strong, the modeling, I'm talking about, and the cement texture of her skin and her face, her eyes and her mouth. It's not quite as, as, as sharp and realistic as the earlier Renaissance painting. So uh, Halls was kind of, again, one of those painters who might have been, you know, predicting 200 years later. We talked about this last week, you remember, with the painting of the Maids of Honor by Velasquez. 
Uh, here we are 200 years before Impressionism and some of the Dutch painters and well, Velasquez was Spanish, so just say some European painters were already experimenting uh, with techniques that weren't strictly realistic. Okay, so there is cement texture, but it's, it's not super sharp. And the same is true for the modeling, except around her chin and of course her eyes, that's pretty strong. Is it stable or dynamic? Uh, that's hard to say. She's sitting probably, maybe standing upright, um, but we, we do have a tilt to her head. And of course the, 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 you know, the line of her blouse is curved. So it's both, you see the part of her breasts uh, and her arms. Yeah, oh, admit, okay, hang on. We got one more person coming in. Hello, welcome. We're just on the second must know uh, by Franz Halls. Okay. Um, anyway, so the last three or four elements here are color. Well, here's what's unusual too. Look at the background. That's very modern looking for the early 1600s. It's, it's surprisingly modern looking. Uh, there's just bands of uh, kind of modeled, you know, that's the only word for that, mixed, right? Modeled colors in bands behind her head. There, we don't know if she's indoors or outdoors. It's, it's really amazing. In some ways, I think uh, Halls don't write this, must have taken a time machine to the 1800s and seen the first Impressionist paintings, which did that. We'll talk about that at, near the end of this class. Um, but so just say that there is no sense of, of, of uh, depth here, of space. The only technique really is overlapping. We already covered that. So, but the background is mostly cool and her skin is warm, her dress is warm and her blouse is cool. And of course her hair is dark black, so it's neutral. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the two eyes, two lips, uh, you know, the, the, the hair, right? Uh, and the folds of her, her blouse. Uh, and the line here, it's not very obvious if there is outline, but it seems to be just implied. So again, that would be almost like an early impressionistic technique, but just say there is no obvious outline in this painting. Uh, it's mostly colors side by side that form the boundaries between parts of the object. Okay, and let's see. Um, balanced, left to right, yes. Top to bottom, it's unbalanced toward the bottom, of course. Okay, now we get to the most important artist of tonight. And I will tell you that there will be one of the next few slides, the first of the two Rembrandt slides will be uh, highly probably, have a, I'm sorry, you gotta rephrase it, high probability of being on the midterm because it's so important. But first, here's how I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna tell you who Rembrandt was. There's no way to do that with just one slide and then t just talk about his background and keep that single slide on. And, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't do the job. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you everything I, I think you should know in the short time we have about Rembrandt before we get to the must know. And then I will summarize some of that again when we are actually doing the must know slide. Okay, so this isn't a must know, but I will give you the title of that one. The first must know of Rembrandt is two words night and then watch you know that's a group of people who you know patrol at night we'll talk all about it in a few minutes night watch and rembrandt you probably know how to spell but i'll spell that r-e-m-b-r-a-n-d-t rembrandt and the date uh, was 1642. This is not obviously the night watch. It should be obvious. This <laughs> is not a group of people getting ready to go out on patrol. This is a self-portrait. So let's say this. Here's what you should write uh, to, to get started on the meaning of the must knows. There are two of them by Rembrandt. You know, that tells you right there how important he was. We usually don't have one slide by each artist uh, that's on the syllabus. Okay, Rembrandt was the most influential is the right word, I would like to say, an original of all the 17th century Dutch painters, more so even than Halls, because have you ever heard of Halls before you took this class? I bet nobody has, right? I, I did because I've been to Holland, a bunch of high friends that are from there, but most people outside of Holland never heard of Halls even though they had a similar way of portraying the poor and dispossessed, but stylistically, Rembrandt was way ahead of all the other painters. So I'll say that again. Rembrandt was the most original, right? 
you could say innovative if you want, and one of the most influential. So one of the most original and influential of all European, I would go that far, European, not just Dutch, painters of the 1600s. Okay, why? Well, we're going to see why. Now, this is self-portrait, so you can stop writing for a minute and just listen. You notice he's got a feather. You've heard the phrase, you got a feather in your cap because you achieved something. Well, there he is. He's got a feather in his cap. And the cap looks like it's pretty fancy, right? And then we see his, right? The, 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 it looks like gold or some other kind of fancy uh, material uh, and, a, and a jacket that's not obviously a poor working man's jacket. So what's happening here? It's a self-portrait. He's looking at us. So now we're going to go a close up to his face. What expression? There's no right or wrong here. So I'm just going to ask, you know, I'm sure some of you have already wondered, what's he thinking? What is anybody guess what his, his state of mind is or what emotion he's feeling here? by the way his eyes are looking at us and the expression on his face. Anybody? A little surprised? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Yes, you said it. Yeah, I was about to say that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because here's why. Because he was he came from a, a, a lower middle class. You can't say, you know, poor, but he wasn't even solid. Just say a lower working class background. He had no mentor. These are things that people usually who are successful have before they become successful as painters, right? So he came from a lower middle class, you know, but in essence today we'd call that poor uh, background. And he had no mentor and he taught himself how to paint. Those three things alone are pretty impressive because of how famous and successful he became. So what is this, now you should write this again, that he became successful early on because of his original technique it's his version of the spotlight effect. See where the light is hitting his cheek there, right? And the whole painting is focused on just one side of his face. He invented that version of the spotlight effect. Now, you should have already seen that part of the lecture last week. Remember I said the original use of that was um, Caravaggio, the first Baroque painter. He invented the idea of light shining on a certain part of a painting, but Rembrandt, took that a step further. So this is what you should be remembering about him that makes him different, unique, and innovative. He thought of it as a way of illuminating the person's inner soul or their personality or their state of mind or all three. So yes, exactly, there was Luis, right? I think, yes, he is surprised at his own success. He's only in his 20s here. And he can afford things he could never, his father, his family could never have dreamed of buying clothes like this. But it didn't last, and we'll say why, for uh, unexpected reasons. For several years, just keep it simple and say, he was very, excuse me, something in the air here. Sorry. A very successful painter, mostly portraits, but not only. He also painted uh, scenes from the Bible and historical scenes. So he painted you know, group portraits, solo or single portraits, and historic and biblical scenes. And he made money off them. And for a while he was quite successful financially and professionally. So let's move on now to uh, one of his biblical scenes. I'll keep this brief because it's not the must know. That's about three slides from now, but it's typical the way it's the blinding of Samson. But some of you may find this interesting. There's blood spurting out of his eye. This is a scene from the Bible where, right, uh, Delilah, right, tricked Samson, the strong man, right? Some of you know the story. You don't have to write any of this now. Just listen to this for this slide. It's not part of the notes you need. And, of course, he that tells us he, he was a very devoutly religious person, Rembrandt. But <clears throat> that isn't unusual at all that far back. But he would interpret the most violent scenes from the Bible, like the blinding of Samson, or the beheading of some, you know, uh, uh, somebody in the Bible, because there's, there's a lot of violent acts in the Bible, if you didn't ever happen to know that. Uh, and he would portray that as one of, see, here she is taking it, uh, that's Delilah taking Samson's hair, which was the source of his strength, right? None of which you need to remember. So he's depicting a scene in a much more bloody, you know, violent, confrontational way than most painters would have, partly because he's living through a time that was full of wars. I mean, the religious wars of the 1600s plus the plagues 
were just de decimating populations all over Europe, including Holland. Okay, now let's go to the next muscle. Now you need to take notes again, because even though this is not, I'm sorry, I said must know. I apologize. It's not yet the must know. That is the next slide. But if you don't understand this one, you won't understand the main facts or meaning of the uh, night watch, which is the next slide. So here we go. All right. I'll say this slowly. I already said Rembrandt was already famous uh, and successful at an early age, right? Financially and professionally, to his own surprise. By his 30s, he had been a success for over a decade. How so? By painting group corporate portraits. That's where the money was in Holland at that time. Holland is the birthplace of the stock market and capitalism. If you didn't know that, that's an important detail. So he was in a place where money was the main goal of most educated people. He wasn't like that. But for a while, he got caught up in that. It happens to people, artists and others, <clears throat> when they need to, you know, feed their family. He had several children by this time. And, you know, a lot of other family members, his, his parents back in their village, he sent them money. So he was painting for money. And almost all of his commissions were things like this group corporate portraits. Now, that's an important detail. So you should be writing that because it will ex I'll explain why in the next slide. <clears throat> this is one of the most famous. It's called, you don't have to know the name of this one, The Anatomy Lesson. And so supposedly this man who actually was a doctor, famous doctor, would travel. Well, actually he did travel. I don't mean supposedly he, the man in black, was a real surgeon. And he would, I think it's rather, you know, grim here, but hey, that's what they did. Yeah, it's a medical school, in other words. Or is it? No, it's misleading. And it's not Rembrandt's choice. These men are supposedly medical students, you know, young guys in their 20s for the, well, look at their faces. No way. These guys are in their 50s and 60s. So who are they? They are the corporate board of an HMO. Now, you might want to think for a second, wait a minute, there can't have been HMOs and, you know, uh, for-profit insurance back then. Yes, there was. It's almost like the way we think of it now, except the difference is, of course, everything was done in person and on paper. Yes, there were for-profit hospitals and there was no medical care for the poor unless you were lucky enough to go to a church or, uh, you know, a convent or somewhere where there was someone trained and they could help you. Uh, you were on your own. But if you were well-to-do, upper middle class or wealthy, you could afford to go to a hospital if you needed to and get good medical care as, be as good as it was. So that's what this scene, I'll summarize it. This scene depicts a uh, group of uh, CEOs is what they are. <laughs> you could just say officers or executives, if you want to keep it simple, of a for-profit hospital who wanted their portraits painted and Rembrandt obliged them by making every one of them equally important. You see that? The light is shining on all of their faces as much as it is on the only real doctor. These, these guys haven't picked up a scalpel in years, probably decades, but he, he is a practicing doctor. So he came along to show you know this and then for some reason, these guys said, hey, stick around. We got Rembrandt down the road. The, you know, asking Rembrandt to come back to paint this scene as though they were all actual students of um, the anatomy. And maybe some of them had been, I'm sure, but at this point they were hiring him as corporate group portrait is what it was. He burned out, that is Rembrandt burned out on it. And here's the, the, the price he paid for it. Okay, now we're at the muscle. This is a very important slide. It's his most famous painting, Rembrandt's most famous. I already said Night Watch, and I gave you the, the date, 1642. Why is this so important? It's just a group of guys getting ready to go out on night patrol with their weapons and you know their uniforms. Oh, it's much more than that. So I'll start by saying, yes, this is a group portrait, but way different than anything he ever did before. And it cost him everything except his life. He sacrificed his whole career, his home, his income, and all of his clients abandoned him because of this painting. That should get your attention. What? <laughs> How could that be? Here's what happened. All of these people in this painting paid an equal amount of money to him, just like the, you know, former medical, you know, the, the, the HMO guys, the CEOs 
of the medical group in the last portrait. They all expected to get a similar kind of portrait where their faces were equally lit up and emphasized and no one got more or less attention. That's not what Rembrandt, well, he was bored, tired, burned out is a better word, burned out on doing group corporate portraits. So instead of that, he chose to show a scene in action where you can hear, at least when I look at this painting, it's life-size, by the way. It's on the wall of the museum in Amsterdam. It's life-size. And you can feel, the, and even I can hear the sound of the clanking you know, metal of their armor, right? Their swords, their shields, their muskets, right? Uh, as they all get ready, their conversation. And it's like a jumbled mass of people in motion. He wanted to capture that moment of them getting ready to go out on patrol. Now, what are they doing? There was no police departments back then. This was a patrol for a wealthy neighborhood. It was a private, you know, security guard group, if you want to call it that. That's what it boils down to. So they're about to go out on patrol, probably midnight shift. It looks like it's, you know, that, you know, quite late, obviously. So it's the um, late night, you can just say it that way, or midnight shift. And the only three people whose faces, or maybe you could say four, are clearly e equally emphasized. Even this guy's turned to the side. This man here, these are the two of the officers, and this man here. And then these, this guy's even further back then. So in other words, you don't see the full body of anyone or fa fa direct facial right, view, except these two guys, the guy in red and the guy in black, and then a side view of him. All the others are obscured by, look, this one even has someone's arm in front of his face. And then this guy's looking sideways. You don't see the rest of the bodies. A whole bunch of these men never even were portrayed except the tops of their helmets and things. In the so guess what happened? Here's how to summarize it. When he finished this painting and he invited all of these men to come see it to get paid, of course, they hated it. They didn't pay him a single guild or you could say coin because that's a Dutch you know, money. You could just say he didn't get anything, no money for it. They rejected the painting, walked out, angry stomped out of his studio when they saw what he had done they didn't expect this they expected them to be lined up you know looking equal and you know equal lighting on them all uh <clears throat> like wax figures i guess and when that didn't happen they refused to pay him and then they went out and badmouthed him to the rest of well holland but certainly at least amsterdam where he lived so just say almost all of his clients abandoned him after this painting because of the dissatisfaction of this group of men and their anger at him. So he lost in a little bit, I think it was like within six months, but let just say within a short time, he lost his income, he lost his studio and his house. He actually had to borrow money for paints, if you can believe that, after this. And then uh, his uh, wife died. So he had to move to a small place in the Jewish ghetto of Amsterdam, which was considered the worst neighborhood because the Jews were allowed to come to Amsterdam, some parts of Europe they weren't even allowed to come into, uh, but they, they were supposed to stick to their neighborhood, right? That The word ghetto, as you may know, is a Jewish word. So he moved into a neighborhood, I think it was right next to or on the edge of the Jewish ghetto, because technically he wouldn't be in the ghetto since he wasn't Jewish. But he, he then spent the rest of his career painting the poor and dispossessed and that was where some of his best work at after this. But this painting, in other words, him choosing to paint his own style and do something new and different or innovative cost him nearly everything in his career. Uh, and, and oh, and he lost his paintings. They took the paintings away from him because he became bankrupt and the government or city, and it was a city of uh, Amsterdam, if you believe that, their most famous painter, they ripped like two dozen paintings off the walls of his studio when he got evicted and uh, after the bankruptcy court, you know, to, it, so he couldn't even sell his own paintings that he'd already done for his own uh, interest or, or for future income. He had a few left, he, they didn't get them all, but they took most of his paintings. You wanna see a really a heartbreaking movie that explains all this? It's just called Rembrandt with Charles Lawton, the greatest actor of the 1930s. You probably never heard of his British actor. He played the Hunchback of Notre Dame in the original movie version of that. And he played Henry VIII in a movie called Henry VIII, but he really nailed it when he played Rembrandt. And he, it tells the story of this, what happened to him after this painting. It's just called Rembrandt. It's on either Netflix or Amazon, 1938 or something. Anyway, so what you see here 
is a turning point in both his career and the history of painting in Europe. Because after this, other painters saw it. And when they heard what happened to him for a while, they said, well, we shouldn't try that. But you know, some of them finally said, the heck with that. I think he was trying to teach us how to paint more lifelike, spontaneous, realistic scenes. And so this really did, that's why I say he was so uh, influential. Okay. Set to precedent. Yes, yes, yes. That's a good phrase. Another one. Yeah, that'd be a good one you could use, or you can say it was a seminal, S-E-M-I-N-A-L is a good work of art, because certain things like certain works of architecture do that. Uh, and obviously certain paintings, we were just talking about this one. Yeah, or sets of precedent, yeah. Groundbreaking, you've heard that phrase. Yeah, there are a lot of ways you could you could say that. Yeah, this painting really uh, was uh, a watershed, <laughs> a game changer, you know, <laughs> these words now. Is Johnson & Johnson vaccine gonna be a game changer? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, hope you guys are right. gonna soon get your <laughs> vaccines. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting my- Yeah, I'm, I'm planning on getting my vaccine. You know, soon, I hope. Yeah. Well, okay, let's wrap it up with a formal analysis and then let's see how far we can go by, uh, oh, we're doing okay on the time, actually. We're doing fine. All right, formal analysis, a lot to say about this, so I'll say it slowly, very slowly. And if you need me to, I'll repeat any of these uh, nine elements here. First of all, for space, you have foreshortening and diminishing size. I see it on the floor as a foreshortening and, and maybe to some extent, uh, these guys' shoulders here, right? But certainly on the floor. And then diminishing size, well, their heads get smaller the further back they go. It does have scientific perspective. You just can't see a horizon because it's an indoor nighttime scene. It's inside an armory, you know, where like now the National Guard would keep their weapons whenever they have a call to duty. So it's a little bit like that. Only these guys aren't working for everybody, supposedly. The National Guard is supposed to defend any, you know, citizen or property that needs defending. These guys are only defending a wealthy uh, set of people in a wealthy neighborhood. Uh, they're, they're not mercenaries, you wouldn't wanna go that far. Um, <clears throat> they're not gonna start a war or anything, but they're there for protecting well-to-do property in a well-off neighborhood. So anyway, you see the diminishing size overlapping uh, and some for uh, sorry foreshortening. I meant and overlappings everywhere. Of course, uh, I don't see atmospheric perspective, uh, but there is a vanishing point. Okay, now the largest mass is hard to say. Is it this wall? I guess you could say that, and then it would be these two men because they're closer to us, and then the guy in red. That's how I'd see it. Uh, and then of course this is a warm color. If you can tell, it's yellow. By the way, no one knows who this woman is. That's another mystery of this painting. Some think it's his, his recently deceased wife. Others think it's his mother. And some say it's just the wife of one of them. But why would one of them have their wife there when there's like 40 or 50 guys getting ready to go out? And why would she be kneeling or, or sitting? It's hard to tell if she's sitting on a stool or something. It's a, nobody, it, that's never been explained that I've ever read. There are theories on who that woman is. She does look kind of ghost-like to me. So maybe she is kind of an apparition. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, we can say she's certainly warm mostly where you see the yellowish colors, of course. And uh, what skin tones you do see where they're not blocked by someone's arm uh, are all warm. But then there's a lot of neutral black here because that was a popular color for military uniforms and uh, right? And then the cement texture is pretty sharp and realistic, but the modeling is soft and diffused. It's clearly soft and diffused. He did that almost all, you see that on the wall and on the faces of the people further behind the front row. So soft diffuse modeling on most of the figures and on the background, uh, but still realistic and strong and realistic cement textures, hair, clothing, skin, of course. Um, and then we have uh, balance, yes, left to right, absolutely. Top to bottom, it's unbalanced, of course, toward the bottom. The rhythm is obvious. I mean, look, I can almost hear the clacking of these wooden spears. I guess they're called pikes, actually is the right word as they are pulled off the wall, if they, you know, bump into each other and the sounds of the, you know, all the metal, as I said earlier. So anyway, you see the uh, rhythms of all the weapons, the hats, the arms and legs, of course. Uh, it is mostly, is it mostly stable? Technically, look at the human figures, what poses you can see. Most of them are standing upright. In the front row, they are for sure. But then this guy here is leaning over the drum and then these people are hunched over, this man's holding. So it's more dynamic than stable. 
the more you look, the more dynamic it, it, it appears to be. And the uh, the lines are the outlines. There are outlines are uh, thin. Okay, uh, let's go to. Let's see how we do it. Did I miss anything? Texture, color, modeling, space. I think I got all. Yeah. Um, this is the next must know. It's also Rembrandt, and it's three words: "The Jewish Bride" by Rembrandt, 1665. The Jewish Bride. Rembrandt, 1665. He painted this when he lived. It wasn't actually in, but just a near. But he spent a lot of time in the Jewish ghetto of Amsterdam. I mean, you pretty much have to say that Jewish ghetto where, you know, not not London, not Paris. There were ghettos, Jewish ghettos there too. Amsterdam was the first uh, city in Europe to accept the Jews that were kicked out of Spain. If you have to write that, but you know, when Isabella and Ferdinand, the ones that sent Columbus on a, <laughs> a, a a sailing adventure, which he didn't know where he was and all that silly stuff that same king and queen they kicked all the jews and muslims out of spain when they finally took over the last part of it from the, the moors so many what of them ended up again yeah this is the jewish bride three words the jewish bride but there's a lot more to it than just oh it's a it's a portrait of a couple a married couple it is but there's more to it than that okay so let's start with the fact, I already said it, but I'll repeat that because it's important specifically to this painting, the meaning of this. This was painted near the end of Rembrandt's life after he'd lost most of his well-to-do clients or almost all of them. I don't know if, yeah, he had a few left. A few people came back to him. So just say most of his wealthy uh, or prosperous, you could say the clients had abandoned him after the night watch. I already explained why. Uh, but he still could, could get enough commissions that's the right word remember with two m's commissions you know assignments jobs to pay people for less money than the, than the well-to-do for instance this couple they may look really wealthy because look how fancy their clothes are but they were jewish and limited in the what they could do by the laws of the time in terms of what kind of businesses and how what kind of clients they could and they certainly weren't allowed to probably advertise at least outside the ghetto so they weren't poor oh no they're probably solid middle class but they were part of what you would have to call the dispossessed of dutch society because as i just said the jews were required to live in a certain section of the bigger cities in amsterdam and uh Oh, well, you don't need to know the other Dutch cities, The Hague, Rotterdam, whatever. Just say Amsterdam. Amsterdam is the home city uh, for most of his adult life of Rembrandt. Uh, and he did almost all his famous paintings there, including this. So near the end of his life, the point is to summarize it, he focused on uh, people who were rejected by mainstream society. It's another way of saying it, such as Jewish families uh, or individual portraits Usually he painted group portraits of, I'm not group, I misspoke, family portraits, often even with several family members in the same painting. This one, it's just a couple. They've been married for decades. Look, you can tell. It's probably, they, you know, their grandparents by now, almost certainly. And what's he captured here? Oh, it's just, so, uh, this painting, by the way, is right next to the Night Watch on the wall of the same museum in Amsterdam. You, if you ever get to Amsterdam, you should go there. Well, first of all, you got the Van Gogh Museum, the world's most famous collection of Van Gogh paintings in, in a separate museum. And then this is the state, they call it Rijks, it means state museum. And it has some of the greatest Rembrandts ever and, and Halls and uh, Van Dyck, right? All these famous Dutch painters in one museum. This is in that museum. It's quite a contrast because there's nothing military about this or, you know, uh, they're, they're quiet. And what are they doing? That's, here we go. Expressing their deep, long, lifelong, there we go, that's what I'm going to say, deep, lifelong love. There's your next alliteration. Their lifelong love for each other. In other words, this is a relationship that's endured the test of time. <laughs> and he admires that. He lost his first wife some kind of illness and then he wanted to marry someone he met after that but he couldn't because he was bankrupt they wouldn't let people marry when if they'd been declared bankrupt <laughs> what yeah well that's the way the laws were back then so he just had to live in sin right with his second basically she was his wife 
<clears throat> in any case, he couldn't remarry legally, but he admired people who had strong family values. And he tried his best to help his sons, though once he lost a lot of his income, he, he wasn't always able to help them financially. So here he admires the fact that they have an abide, deep abiding love, right? And that's expressed brilliantly, the, the expression on their faces, the body language of him leaning towards her, and of course, especially by the placement of their hands. So this is typical. Now here, he, he, the spotlight is on all those things. And that's because he wants you to no notice the entire, you know, effect of this painting is to emphasize their deep, long-lasting love or lifelong love for each other. And it's, it's an important theme with him because he lost a lot of that during his lifetime in more ways than one. Uh, but he never became bitter or cynical or, uh, you know, uh, depressed. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> he managed to keep his optimism about people and human beings and life. Uh, pretty, pretty remarkable man. Okay, so formal analysis, that's pretty much the whole meaning. It's, he died shortly after this painting was finished. In fact, I believe it was the very next year. Yeah, so this is near, right near the end of his life when he had done a series of paintings. Oh, by the way, you could add one more fact. While he uh, was in that neighborhood, which was near the Jewish ghetto, a poor neighborhood, right? He would take long walks and sketch people uh, just in the streets. And one time he decided when he saw some of the uh, abuse, they'll just say, you know, suffering, that's a better word, suffering of the homeless and the poor. And the, you know, some of them were lepers, right? Or otherwise, you know, infected with all kinds of medical and uh, uh, lifelong problem, some of them, he decided to paint a painting called, I'm sorry, draw, a draw, uh, called If Jesus Came to, I think it says Amsterdam, I forget the last word, it might be Holland, and it shows Jesus ignoring the rich people in the homes further up this street where you can see the wealthier houses, and he's spending his time with all the poor people on the streets and trying to help them. It's, you know, a strong theme of his that he believed that, you know, society needs to do more to help people that are obviously not as well off as some people are. And that's when he, of course, showed that his willingness to live that, not just talk the talk, by sacrificing, like I just said, with the Night Watch, uh, all, the, all the success he'd had uh, in order to have integrity. That's the phrase. I really should end with that. This painting is an example of his latter phase in which he had, re, you could say, recaptured or just focused on his own artistic integrity, which not all artists are able to resist the temptation just to, of course, cater to the powerful. That's understandable, but he did. <clears throat> okay, formal analysis. It's well balanced, except that he's taller, so you could say it's weighted it's, it's somewhat, I guess you could say slightly towards the left, and because of the width of their, uh, you know, clothing, uh, you'd have to say it's, it's unbalanced toward the bottom. Um, here we just have, I think I do see, yeah, foreshortening on his collar here, I guess, to some degree, but it's minimal. There's very little. It's mostly just overlapping. The modeling is very strong around them. Um, and here the simulated textures on their faces are diffused, as is the modeling. So on their faces, well, actually it's somewhat on their hands too, but especially their faces. Uh, this simulated texture and the modeling are diffused, but on the rest of his clothing, her dress, um, and even their hands is fairly strong and, and real sharp modeling and some texture. Of course, the colors are mostly warm. Just about all the colors are warm here, except for his hat, which is black. Even the background is obviously a kind of brownish warm wall of some kind. Probably, it's hard to tell if it's wood, but probably wood. Okay, and then the rhythm is obvious. Look at all the, with their hands, all the different fingers here and the patterns in, in her dress and his uh, robe here, which of course the sleeve is the prominent part for, that he's emphasizing here. Uh, and then we have thin, everything has thin outline. Uh, for space, I think I already said yes, it's overlapping. Let's see, am I forget? Oh, is it stable or dynamic? Well, he seems more dynamic than her, uh, but on the other hand, her, her arms, or at least the lower arms and her hands are uh, placed, right, in a dynamic fashion. So you just have to say it's both, really. 
And of course, he's the largest mass in Ben-Hur. Okay. Uh, I think I covered, yeah, everything on this one. All right. Now, you don't have to write this. Just listen. But I just said a few minutes ago of that last must know now, the next one will be the very next slide, that Rembrandt liked to paint people in the Jewish ghetto uh, as groups of family members. And this is one of his most famous paintings. In fact, I think it is here he died. You don't have to know about it. Uh, it's called The Prodigal Son. And it's a story from the Bible in which, of course, the Bible, we're talking about the early part of the Bible is written by Jewish people about that period when, of course, there was no Christianity yet. So this is a Jewish family that he uh, may have paid. I don't know. It's hard to say. He probably did pay them <laughs> to pose. And it's supposed to be this scene from the Bible in which this man, right, with the red cape over his shoulders is the father of two sons. And here's one of them, the successful one, the older brother. And then here's his loser, whatever you want to call him, younger, less, less isn't even the word, unsuccessful, yes, completely homeless. You can tell if you look, look at his feet. <laughs> look at that. He can, doesn't even have soles on the, uh, in his shoes and his hair. He's got lice on his head. That's why it's shaved. And this is an uncle and there's the mother. They're all looking on when this guy had disappeared, the younger son, each of them got, you know, a big amount of money from him when they turned, I don't know what, 18 or 20, when they became young adult. He gave each of his two sons an equal amount of money and told them to use it wisely. This guy went out and spent it, wine, women, and, you know, dancing or whatever, uh, at various things that didn't, of course, uh, give him, a, you know, a good financial security. And this son stayed with his father, invested back his money back in his father's business, became, you can tell by the way he's dressed, quite, quite successful. So this is the moment in which 20 years it's been since anyone in this family, these four people, have seen this younger brother. And he appeared unannounced on the doorstep of the father and asked for the father to forgive him. And it, again, look how emotionally moving this is. Look at the expression on the faces of, you know, the... Um, Prodigal, they call it. Prodigal means wasteful. The son who wasted his his uh, inheritance and the father might have easily just said, get lost. You you had your chance, but he doesn't. Obviously, he accepts him back. Very quick, quick footnote. Uh, I can relate to this painting more than a lot of others, even though Rembrandt did this kind of painting a lot, because I had a brother who disappeared when uh, I was about 30 and we assumed he was dead. Uh, seriously, for over 30 years, we didn't know where he was. We heard some rumor that he was on the East Coast about a year or two after he disappeared. Uh, it was in the 80s. And then about two years ago, I got this email from the Santa Rosa JC email. He'd somehow look me up. He's living in Dallas, Texas, working at a church. He's still homeless, but they give him a place to stay. And of course he doesn't have to dress like this guy anymore, but I'll bet he did. I call that a miracle. We were gonna to get together in the last year, but obviously it's not safe to travel until soon when we can all hopefully get back to uh, being in person with the people we care about. So I'd call that a miracle, call it what you want. In any case, uh, I could get mad at him. Why didn't you contact me? And remember my other two brothers, see there are four of us, I'm the old, why didn't you tell us where you were? Just once or twice touch base. Uh, I don't know his reasons. It probably has something to do with some mental conditions that he inherited from my mother who had them. And in any case, I'm not gonna be judgmental. And that's the point of this painting. It's not, life's too short. It isn't really healthy to be judgmental unless there's you know no other way you can you know handle some. But if, if it's a family thing and a person asks for forgiveness, it's the right thing to do to forgive them. So it's, I think it's a brilliant painting. All right, now we get to uh, another must know. And this is um, self-portrait is the title, just like it sounds two words, self-portrait. The artist's name is Leister, L-E-Y-S-T-E-R, okay? And the date is 1635. She, Judith was her name. You don't have to know her first name, but it was Judith. I can just say Leister but really you should know her first name. She was one of the few very successful female painters in Europe at that time. There were a few dozen 
mostly of all things in Italy. We talked about, remember, with Artemisia Gentileschi, with the uh, Judith and the maidservant. We talked about this last week, but I'll repeat that in this and some of you didn't see that since it was a makeup lecture. So you should watch that though before the midterm, that lecture from week five. Okay, so she here is shown in her studio. She was Dutch. That last name is a Dutch name. And I think she knew Rembrandt. I'm pretty sure. And he had an egal, well, you could tell from what I've said, uh, an egalitarian attitude towards people from different walks of life, you know, like, like Halls did. She definitely knew Halls. In fact, they were friends. And I think he helped promote her career early on. Um, but she had her own talent, of course. And it shows when you see this. I like this a lot because it's not a typical self-portrait. She's laughing almost, enjoying this part of her life where she's now probably in her 30s. I believe that's roughly the age she was uh, after you know many years of struggling. She's become successful. She can make a good living po painting portraits, but when she wants to paint things on her own, just for her own satisfaction, she can. This is a self-portrait of a self-portrait. <laughs> that's her as a musician dressed as a man. Some people say that proves that she, you know, perhaps was bisexual. I don't know. I've never read that she was or wasn't. It isn't what's important about this painting. It is that she is showing herself in a different light than any other male or female painter would tend to do. You know, you can say cross-dressing and that's probably the right phrase, right? Uh, and doing something totally different, you know, performing art as opposed to painting, which are two very different kinds of creativity. Uh, but she's also showing, because she didn't, she wasn't a musician that I know of. She might have known how to play the violin, but she didn't perform and, or make any income off her. From, it was all from painting. But she's enjoying life and she's achieved success on her own terms. That's how I like to put it. And uh, so she did not just paint rich people or kings and queens and noble men and women. I don't even know if she ever painted any wealthy. She probably had to paint some wealthy clients to make a decent income, of course. But she often painted other scenes, including common people. I don't know about this possessed, you know, like Halls and Rembrandt, people that were rejected by society, but she painted average everyday plain people, if you want to call it that way, like middle class and, and even some peasants uh, from Holland. Uh, I'm not sure if she was from what part of Holland, but anyway, she moved to uh, another city. It doesn't matter which one. It wasn't Amsterdam. And that's how she met Halls, where he lived. She moved to the same city as him. And he did see her talent early on. And to his credit, he promoted her work and uh, gave her at least some help. But it isn't that he you know, created her success. She, she did that. Anyway, all of those things show here. Her pose, look how self-confident it is. You see that? The way she's leaning back and just looking us directly in the eye, saying, yes, I know I'm a woman and I'm successful at something as almost only men are allowed to do. And I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. And then here, the same expression you can almost see on the face of her other self-portrait within the portrait. But here again, we get this. This is the influence of Halls. These kind of almost impressionistic sweeping, soft, diffused details, right, on her arm. And it's even true on her um, collar, right? You see that to a certain degree. And on the top of her dress. So there's almost like a pre, you can't say it's really impressionistic. That didn't exist in the years. Oh yes, here we go. Um, hello? Welcome. We're just finishing up with this painting, but we, we're going to do one more. And then when we take our break, in case I think it's one or two people join after I said this, don't disappear because at the end of the break, we are going to probably wrap up with one or two more uh, slides and then go straight to the review or discussion, I should say, it's rather a discussion of the test, how it's going to be given, how to study for it, how it'll be graded and answer all your questions. Okay. So you want to be here for that. All right, so let's wrap this up with a formal analysis and do one more slide before we take our break. Um, she's the largest mass, obviously, then the easel, then the palette. That's about it. There are just three objects here. Well, I guess fourth largest would be her paintbrush uh, or the top of her chair, yeah. And then we have the diffuse semantic textures, as I mentioned, on some of the details, her arm, top of her dress, her collar, but the rest of the textures are pretty realistic and sharp on her hand and face and uh, upper part of her, and the back of the chair, even the upper part of her uh, 
dress there. And then we have the rhythm, of course, of the two eyes, the collar itself. The, look how wide that collar is. How can you function like that? Anyway, that's what people wore when they want to be fashionable. And of course, uh, her fingers here, as well as on the painting of herself, and then the paintbrushes here, and her other fingers gripping the palette. So a lot of rhythm. She's leaning back and her collar and the top of her head are round and her upper arm is diagonal. So you'd say it's mostly dynamic. Uh, yeah, really there isn't a lot of stable here except the back of the chair. And, and it would be the edge of the easel, but it does tilt slightly. Uh, or I should say the painting that's on the easel. Um, but most of the lines, maybe this, the per, this figure of herself as a musician is enough standing enough upright that, that it's primarily stable. Everything else is mostly dynamic. For space, you have overlapping. I see foreshortening here on the easel, uh, sorry, I meant the palette, and to some degree her shoulder and the collar. So overlapping, foreshortening. That's it, there's no atmospheric perspective, scientific perspective. I don't see diminishing size here, not really. Just those other two for uh, overlapping, I'm sorry, and uh, foreshortening, yeah, I said it right. And here the line is, is, is only part, in some parts. There's thin outline around her face <clears throat> and her hands, but there's, you know, no obvious outline around the rest of her body. Uh, and to say this figure, though, there's mostly uh, strong lines. In fact, a bold outline on the painted musician image of herself. Okay, um, the, I already mentioned the rhythm. Oh, colors, yes, we've got uh, cool white on her headdress and her collar, <clears throat> neutral black on her the upper part of her dress, a warm reddish color on her sleeve and this part of her dress. And then a mixture of cool on the clothing of the musician image. And of course, warm on their faces, both images and hands. Let's see if I forget, oh, balance. Is it balance? I think it is roughly if you do a line here, left to right, but this is empty space. So you pretty much have to say it's unbalanced toward the bottom. Okay, one more. This is Vermeer, V-E-R-M-E-E-R, -E -E woman holding a balance, woman holding a balance, just like it sounds, Vermeer, V-E-R-M-E-E-R, -E 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 1664, Vermeer is, gonna, I'm just going to cut to the chase, I usually ask people, well, I will ask you one question, if you could guess what's going on here, but let's first talk about all the things you should have in the notes on, uh, on meaning. First of all, Vermeer was a little known local, he wasn't famous during his lifetime. He's become famous. You know, there have been movies made about him, as you may know, right, and plays and books. But while he was alive, he was, uh, he was moderately successful. But he is known for three things. First, a master of interior scenes, which means what? Everyday life events occurring inside a house. I'll say it again. The phrase is, uh, historic Jesus, he was considered, you know, one of the first masters of interior scenes, such as this one. Obviously, it's inside a house in someone's home, a room in their home. So he's a master of interior scenes. Then he also was a master of interior light because he only used the light that came from the natural se settings. Of course, that means his paintings are mostly daytime paintings. In fact, almost all of them are. Uh, so he was a master of interior light. And then he was, you could say fo almost photorealistic. There were no photos this far back, obviously. But the fact is he was super realistic in his details on similar texture of all the objects in his paintings was done with a super sharp quality. When you put those three things together, you get an unusually strong image that draws people in. And that's why he's become more and more famous. Actually, he was forgotten, totally forgotten for a couple hundred years and then rediscovered in the 1800s. And ever since he's becoming more and more famous. There's, there's a movie called the Five Vermeers of New York or something like that. And then there's the one, the girl with the pearl earring with Scarlett Johansson about one of his other paintings. He, he's 
become quite collectible. And then last but not least about who he was, and then we'll talk about this scene, is he only painted 70 paintings. That's, not, that's nothing. Van Gogh painted 2,000 paintings. Of course, he was on fire. He's unusual. Most painters did several hundred during their career. During his entire career, he only painted, that we know of, known, 70 known paintings. We have no evidence that others were destroyed or lost. There's not very many. But he was able to get enough wealthy clients to be able to live off his painting. He supported 13 children. His wife was Catholic. <laughs> 13. Children, so he obviously had to have success financially, but he just didn't seek fame, nor did he move to a big city. He lived in a small town in Holland. Uh, it's uh, Delft, by the way, one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. But, and his house is still there, and he painted the city. It looks much like it is. It's like fifty thousand people, nothing like Amsterdam, which is even back then was hundreds of thousands. So just say a small Dutch city. And so he never moved to the big city to become famous or tried to become famous, but he was successful financially during his lifetime and then he was forgotten. So now what's going on with this painting? Well, we have a woman and I think you can tell from this one, right? What condition she's in, right? Nobody wants to say, oh, we're running short on time. She's pregnant, no question. In this one, there's no guesswork. We know who this woman was. And we know what was happening with this painting. So let's see if I give you a few clues and then we'll, just before we do a quick formal analysis and take the break, I will ask if anybody can put these clues together and come up with what's going on, what's in her mind. Okay, she's weighing her earthly goods, right? That's what we mean. You know, coins, jewelry, you know, gold, silver. And look at her clothing. She's got a fur-lined cape. She's obviously from a well-to-do household here, of course. But something's going on with her. Look at her face. Does she look totally happy? No. It's a pained expression if I've ever seen one. Yes, yes, yeah, you, exactly. You got it. And then there's a clue on the wall behind her. A lot of people had paintings of religious scenes. And that's Jesus up in heaven when people are supposedly the last judgment. You can just say it that way. That's what literally these paintings were called as a group. Just the short word for that is, you know, two words, last judgment, meaning the time when supposedly people get chosen to go to heaven or hell, right? And these are the people going up to heaven. Okay, she's pregnant, very pregnant. She's got a lot of financial security, but she's somehow unhappy. And there's a painting having to do with death behind her. Can anybody guess what's going on with her? What's in her mind? Is she married? Yes. Yeah. Did her and, partner die? Yeah, you guys are right on. Yes. He was a captain of a ship or group. I can't remember. It might even a small group of ships that were at sea when they were lost in a storm just before he's supposed to come home to see the birth of his child. So she is now a single mother, a widow. So she's thinking, can you guess what she's thinking? If you want to put that into a sentence or. How am I going to yeah. care for my child? Yeah, yeah, in an emotional, spiritual way. She'll have plenty of money. That he left her. But there's more to taking care of a person, a child, a family than just money. So he's making the Vermeer, the painter's making the point that she is, yes, she's definitely, uh, you could say, sad or, or, or uh, you know, anxious about the fact that somehow she will never see her husband and he will never see his unborn child. And she may have all the money she needs, but that's not what she needs most. She needs a partner, a mate a husband, a father, all the above to help her raise a child and that child won't have a father. Okay, last thing. Anybody notice something here? Look, isn't that spooky? Did you, did you? Yeah, there's no hair there. The shadow is showing only skin. There's no shadow of oh, any hair. Not quite. You guys are kind of uh, around the, batting around the edges or skirting around the edges. Look at the shape of this. What does that look like? It looks like a hand. Yes, it's the hand of her deceased husband coming back to comfort her and saying, fear not, I will be with you in spirit, if not in body. That's a phrase from the Bible, actually. The point is, it's his way, the artist's way of saying, 
well, maybe she could at least have the comfort if she believes she does. Obviously, she's got a religious painting on the wall that somehow he'll be there with her in spirit. And he's literally coming down from, I guess, heaven, I suppose, to tell her that at that moment. Yeah, that's been, it took, took uh, decades for people to, you know, decide that must be. But once we found out who she was, researchers, this painting is at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., by the way. It's a great museum. I'd say it's the third or fourth best museum in America after the Met in New York, the Art Institute in Chicago, uh, and I guess the Getty in LA, and then and it's a really great museum. Uh, it, it's on the mall in Washington, D.C. If you ever get there, you should go see this painting. Okay, let's wrap it up and take a break. Uh, it's totally balanced. This space equals this space. I think almost absolute verbatim. The amount of space from the bottom of the table to the floor and from this portrait wall to the edge of the uh, framing is the same. And then we have the modeling is strong. It's all super sharp and realistic on her face, on the wall, on the table, on her clothing, as is the cement texture always with him. He always did super sharp, or you could even say photorealistic details. You see that on the object from the table. And then we have, it's mostly stable, isn't it? She's standing upright, even though her clothing bowls outward there somewhat. But look at the objects, the wall, the portrait framing, the tabletop another painting. The, it, it's mostly stable. And then we have the rhythm, of course, of her body, arms, of course, uh, face, the figures in the painting, the objects on the table. Um, and then for space, we have overlapping, foreshortening. And here I'd say diminishing size on this table, on the top of the table. And there is scientific perspective. There's no atmospheric perspective. There'd be a vanishing point beyond the wall. Uh, the lines are thin outlines. Uh, and then the colors are cool on her uh, part of her jacket, warm on the, um, you know, I'm sorry, I meant cool on her jacket, totally, because green and white are cool. Warm on her face, of course, and her skin on her hands, warm on the tabletop, uh, and then cool on the wall, warm on the curtain. You, you get the idea that it's rotating or alternating, I meant, between cool and warm colors. Okay, um, and um, let's see, the largest mass would be her. And then I guess the painting and then the tabletop. It's a close call. Okay, let's call it uh, now 15 minute break, 820. So if we have two more must knows and then we'll go right into the review. So do not disappear. It'll help you do a better job and, and a quicker job of uh, answering the questions on the test. Okay, see you guys in 15 minutes. Okay, uh, let's finish up. We just have two more must knows and then we will spend the rest of the time uh, discussing how the test will be given and the most important and valuable, well, one of the most important things I can help you with, uh, making it easier on of you, all of you for when you study, is to cut down the list of slides and we'll do that together. I'll go over them one week at a time and say cross out this one, that one. And that will reduce the list by at least uh, 40%. Well, actually, I said 30%, sorry, 30%. But it, I'll probably make it more. And, and I'll do the same, roughly at least 30, if not more, percent of the terms, that list of terms to know that, that you won't have to worry about seeing on the midterm. Let's get to that in a few minutes. Moving forward to one of the two remaining must know slides. Let's see, I might or might not have <laughs> on this file. Let's see if I do. Uh, I will do one more thing about it. I just have to, th this Vermeer here, uh, this is called sleeping girl. You know, that would be like someone under 20. That would be the phrase at that time, you know, young woman. And she's in her own home. And she's at a table where some kind of a lunch had been served. And do you notice what just happened? Or can you tell? The, the, uh, it's sort of a tablecloth, very fancy one, but nonetheless, you're right, covering has been bunched up, shoved up into, right, on top of the table. The chair is ajar and the door is open. And you can't see anybody in the entry hall. Can anybody guess what just happened? Did someone just uh, pick up and leave? Yes, and the reason is probably, you might be able to guess, her reaction 
to this, well, we'll just say gentleman caller. I just love this. In other words, this guy was trying to, you know, woo her or otherwise impress her, probably was even interested, maybe, who knows, and eventually marrying her. And he came over and he proceeded to bore her to sleep. <laughs> I mean, he's so uninteresting. She was so uninterested in him that she fell asleep while he was there. And he got mad, like most, you know, male, fragile male egos, got up and shoved the table, the, the chair away from the table and stomped out in an angry huff. I think it's funny. Yeah. Anyway, he shows that he had a sense of humor here. And I don't know if he was paid for this painting. Like a lot of painters, he would often paint scenes that were just for his own enjoyment. Now, let's see. We may or may not have to go back through. We already covered these. These are from last week that you definitely want to see if you didn't watch week five, the video of it on YouTube. Yeah, I think what I have to do now, I know. Okay, so I'm going to do the stop share and then pull up it's another file, <clears throat> which shouldn't be too difficult to do. Why is that there? That was a Rembrandt painting, that last one, right? No, no, that was, uh, no, sorry. That, that was a Vermeer called Sleeping Girl. And it's one of those that's really uh, little known. I don't think I've seen it anywhere outside our slide library. There we go. That's it. Just, you just have to hit the right buttons. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Uh, we're going to be temporarily, yeah, let's see. Pictures. That's it. Sorry. This takes a couple of steps, but realism person. Glass slides. Just navigating this. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, it, it was uh, Vermeer, and it's one of those ones where I'm guessing he did it just maybe as a gift to that woman when she got rid of that unwanted suitor. <laughs> would be my guess. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the weeks, week six. Mm. I'll only give this another minute or so if I can't find it out. Oh, there it is. I got it. It's right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we are going to, whoops. What? No, hang on. <clears throat> I called up the one I wanted. So now let's see if it's all right. If it doesn't come up when we do screen share, we'll just move on with the, the discussion of the exam, which is the most important business. But I didn't want to have to cut those two slides that are at the end of your uh, syllabus. So let's see what comes up. Oh, there it is. OK. Oh, I just can't get rid of all this clutter here. It should take about. 30 seconds. Okay. So hopefully this will work, but sometimes it, when you do it this many steps, it doesn't always immediately come on. Can you guys see this image? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I'm going to enlarge it. And this is not the must know. This is the hallway of the Louvre waiting to come see the Mona Lisa. And it is a Renaissance palace, a Baroque era. Part of it is, I mean, Baroque, <coughs> meaning from the 16, 1700s. <coughs> but the earliest section is from uh, like 1500. So it is the original royal palace, as some of you may know, of the kings of France, which Napoleon converted into an art museum. Okay, this is now, we're going to get just two more must knows. Okay. Um, let's see. To turn it over. The Hall of Mirrors at Versailles is this view. Everyone see it? Okay. But I need to give you context. So now I should take notes on the meaning of this. The, I'll say it again. Hall with two L's 
of mirrors, plural. Versailles, that is the actual title because there's more than one place in the European palaces that have such hallways full of mirrors. They love looking at themselves, you know. So I'll say it again, the hall of mirrors, you don't have to write at Versailles, just comma Versailles. And that's the city in France where it is. V E R S A I L L E S, Hall of Mirrors, Versailles. Okay. And the uh, two architects who designed it are the first one has a two word last name, Le Brun, and that's capital L E and then capital B R U N. And the other architect is Mansart. Capital M A N S A R T, 1678. So, what are we looking at? We are going to look at the interior of one section or one, you know, wing is probably the right word. This is hardly a room. Here it is again. But I want you to see the context. These are, these are my own slides that I took. Um, this is, yeah, oh, here we go. Okay. Welcome, we just started the last two must know slides. This is the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Uh, and so, oh, no, 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 whoever has the radio on, please. <laughs> Thank you, okay, thanks. All right, so here's the meaning part of this one. It's inside, it, this is an interior, right? A section, you could say, or wing, right? Of this palace, it's actually, I uh, believe it's this section here. In any case, this, here's what you should write. This is Versailles, which is a town in France. But people now, when they say that, they just mean the palace complex, which is a city within a city. It's the largest royal compound in the world. It's larger than any other royal palace in England or Italy or Russia or China or anywhere else you could think of. It's the largest royal compound in the world. It has dozens of buildings and several, I think it's over 10 square miles within the gates. See, here are the front gates. This is where you get, as now it's as a tourist site, of course, there's nobody living there. So it's, it's maintained by the government of France and you can go visit it. It's really worth the trip. It takes you about an hour by train from Paris. And it's where all the kings of France from the 1600s until the French Revolution would live and entertain their other, you know, guests. And look at the gold. The gold should tell you right there that they were showing off how wealthy they were, right? They just wanted people to know that we are the most powerful royal family. They were. The French had the biggest empire for a while until the British overtook them. First, it was the Spanish because, you know, obviously with the colonies that they took over from the um, native cultures here in the new world and then the French overtook the Spanish uh, next and they had a pretty big empire and then the English became even more you know uh, larger empire. So this is during the time when the French empire was the largest in the world and it was the wealthiest so they showed off with all the gold and that includes whoops I meant to do this all right let's go now see the actual view of that that's the slide if it's on the exam that you'll see that's real gold what looks like gold is gold <laughs> and these are the mirrors and these are marble and this is parquet or inlay you can use either word don't ask me to spell the word parquet we want to keep moving here it was the q u on the end or inlay Floors, those are very expensive. Of course, there are now almost 400, well, 350 year old wooden floors. And look how well preserved they are. They're in excellent shape. Okay, so what is important about this? There are three things. First, where it is, I just told you, right? So it's just to show off the wealth and power of the kings of France when you came to visit them at their palace complex. You can't call it a palace. That's one building. Oh, this is dozens of buildings scattered over miles and miles and miles. It's, it's, you can't see it all in one day. It's, it's that huge. All owned by one family. <laughs> Even Bezo, Jeff Bezos probably will never <laughs> quite match that. <clears throat> uh, or Bill Gates. Anyway, so what you have here is a way of showing off their power and their wealth, of course, 
and supposedly their good taste in terms of the Baroque style. Here's your incrustation. That's very much part of the meaning. Remember any, any work of art where there's, uh, it's a, um, a drawing, a painting, a sculpture, or a building. If you know the style, that's part of the meaning that you can use to describe it either in your papers or on the exams. It's Baroque. It, it's, it's so Baroque, it screams that at. Look at the bulbous shape of the ceiling, the tops of the mirrors, and the decorations up here. These are angels and shields and armor symbolizing the French military and all that. And of course, in encrustation of ornamentation is really obvious with this one. The unseen presence is, of course, the king and or his power, you know, the king of France and his, his power. And, uh, and then we have, uh, right, the emotion. Again, it's supposed to be awe. You're supposed to feel awe and, you know, uh, oh, admiration, you know for the power of this king and it would of course meant, be meant to impress everyone who came to visit even even other kings right so the last two facts about the meaning though are actually i think the most important ones besides where it is does anybody know either one or both of the two world changing events that occurred in this hallway one of them over 200 years ago and the other in the previous century anybody know well, I know the one of the 100 years ago, the one 200 years ago, um, trying to remember, it was uh, late I 1700s. It happened right before the French Revolution or had was. Yes, yes, the French you're right. Revolution. Yeah, it was the signing of the Treaty of Paris. So this is what you should write. The Treaty of Paris was signed here, which the French forced the British to give up the colonies of what are now the United States. It's, in essence, the birth of the United States was not really at Philadelphia because all we did then, or the, you know, the founding fathers did was declare their intention, their desire to become independent. They weren't, you know, the British army was occupying, right? All the colonies, you know that, right? So this is where America really became a nation in this hallway, it's a pretty important event, right? And the French uh, were so happy because they hated the British for having overtaken them in terms of their power and wealth. Now the British were the biggest empire by this time. So it was 1783, you don't have to know the year. You could say late 1700s if you want that, but you can just say the treaty that created the United States, it was called the Treaty of Paris, in which the French supervised, you could say, right? Well, actually, they negotiated it. They loved it. They wa loved watching the English squirm when they had to give up all their colonies in North America, right? Oh, not all. Well, yeah, basically, all of the land colonies, not the islands in the Caribbean, right? They kept those. So just say that America ended up becoming truly independent by the effects of the treaty signed in this hallway. You could say late 1700s if you want to write the year. It was 1783. It's called the Treaty of Paris. What the other event you said, I'm sorry, that was speaking of, say, what is the other one that occurred not quite 100 years ago, but close? That would be the Treaty of Versailles, which happened at the end of 1918, yeah. which ended the First World War and set, sowed the seeds yes. of the turmoil to follow for the next 20 years. Yes. So the Treaty of Versailles, which is really an important turning point in history was the one that where Germany was forced to pay all the costs to every other country uh, that they had defe defeated them, sorry, all of the allies. They had to pay all the costs of World War I and that led to poverty and inflation and, and uh, you know, all kinds of economic hardship in Germany. And yes, it contributed, you can't say it's the only reason, it contributed to the rise of Hitler. So World War I ended with the Treaty of Versailles. It was actually 1919 in this hall. And my great uncle Woody, you know, he wasn't no real, <laughs> but uh, Woodrow Wilson is, the, the United Nations is his idea. People think it was Roosevelt, but Roosevelt was riffing off of, of Wilson's idea to create an international body to prevent more wars. It's it uh, an idea ahead of its time. <laughs> it still is, I guess. But at least we try now to prevent wars with the UN. Anyway, so so that whole set of 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 uh, you know, just say the Treaty of Versailles. Keep it simple. There were a lot of little sidebars, and you know, like all treaties, it was hundreds of pages long. Most treaties, anyway. So so it set the the terms from which Germany surrendered and and paid all of the other countries for the cost of World War One, and they resented it, and it gave Hitler an excuse to do what he did 
and so you can say, yeah, that was uh, what you said was well put. The roots of World War II go back to this right room in 1919 when that treaty was signed. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. It's totally balanced. Almost all architecture from the Baroque era is symmetrical. Of course, you can see that. Um, the largest mass, I'm gonna go with the ceiling because it's curved. If you flattened it out, it'd be wider than the floor. The second largest is the floor and then the walls, of course, and then the mirrors. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the rounded mirrors, the painted and carved ceiling with all the gold decorations, the parquet floors, there's so much rhythm. It's almost entirely dynamic except for these sections. Well, the floor is stable, okay, but the walls, well, they're both because of the lining of the mirrors, but the uh, the whole tops of all the mirrors are all rounded and the ceiling is totally dynamic. So it's both. Colors warm on the floor, mostly warm on the ceiling and mostly cool on the walls. Although this marble does have a liver like color, but then the rest of the marble is, is uh, gray and the mirrors are clearly kind of an off, you know, translucent color. So they, they you know, kind of, project an off-white effect and therefore the walls seem mostly cool. The line here is visual line formed by the shadows and the modeling is just that shadows, natural modeling of sh created by shadows from the sun. And that of course is not done with painted line or anything else, but there is painted line and carved line on the ceiling. You see it here a little bit on the walls, but mostly on the ceiling. <clears throat> and then it is dynamic as could be. I think I already said that, didn't I? I understand. Yeah. Oh, the the um, the rhythm. What are we forgetting here? I'm forgetting something, right? Mon oh, balance. Totally, completely symmetrical. Oh, space. Oh, that would be helpful. Real space. Remember, with architecture, it's not it's not the technique of space. This is about over 200 feet long. This hallway with about a, um, a 20 foot high ceiling. Just say one long hallway over 200 feet long with about a 20 foot high ceiling. What about uh, rhythm? Mm. I thought I did that, but if I didn't, here we go. You can see that the these are called pilasters. You don't have to know that word, but they're not really columns. They're just decorative panels looking like columns. So the pilasters and the mirrors created repeated shapes. And of course the curved ceiling and the floor, the parquet patterns in the floor. So there's a lot of repeated patterns, yeah. So wait, hold on. Now, before you move on, so can you uh, summarize all that? Um, I, I think we want to get to the review. If you had a specific question, one or two very specific questions, I could answer them. Because remember, you guys have, all of you, Luis and all everyone, the right to go back and just pause this and replay it when it's uh, going to be posted on, by Friday. On, on uh, YouTube, but do you have a specific question or two? I can't repeat. So that. after you said balance, what else did you say? Oh, well, this uh, one of your fellow students asked uh, for about the rhythm, so I'll repeat that. The rhythm is the repeated uh, arches. Here we go. I'll say that. Yeah, the arches, right above the mirrors, the patterns in the floor. You don't have to get too detailed, and the decorations on the ceiling create lots of repeated shapes. Okay, so uh, again, anything you still need to check on or, or add to your notes, you can do with the recording on Friday. Okay, uh, there's another view of it, by the way. Well, that's actually the hall, and this is him. I just thought you don't have to write any more notes. You've got plenty on it now. That's him okay. dressed as a Roman emperor. Yeah, you've got enough notes on this. Is There's one more must know, and then we'll get to review for the slide. There he is as a Roman emperor trampling over Turkish soldiers because uh, the King Louis the uh, 14th, I didn't say who started the palace. I should have added that as a fact about the meaning. Who started this? Louis the 14th, the, the longest reigning king in French history. He ruled for over 60 years, as long as most people lived. And he's the one that built the French empire into the most powerful empire in the world, which it remained over a hundred years that way. So this is him, Louis the 14th. And you could say he built the palace complex or he started it. It, it kept getting added on to by other kings, of course, until the French Revolution when the peasants came and took it away. Uh, but you have enough notes on the meaning. OK, all right. Yeah, that's my slide. See, I think my slide's better. Look, you could actually see the king on his horse. You don't have to write any of this. Uh, but here's a dead Turkish soldier. The Turks were invading Europe, right? And so he was defeating them in battle at several different times. 
And so you hear our angel saying, what a great victor he is, blowing trumpets down, looking down from heaven. I mean, it's, it's all to glorify the ego of the then king, Louis XIV. Okay, now we get to something that is near and dear to my heart because this is an amazing story. Our last must know before the midterm. St. Paul's, you know, with the Apostle S. Cathedral. The architect's name was Wren. That's W-R-E-N, last name, Wren. St. Paul's Cathedral, 1710. Okay, if it's on the exam, this is the view you'll have. So let's do that first. And then I'm going to tell you uh, uh, an amazing fact about it that you don't have to write the details, but just maybe one sentence. Somewhere. First of all, it is English Baroque. It's in England and it's a Baroque style. It has these bulbous shapes. You can see that on the clock towers. And, and, and this was meant to be for the clock. It wants, for some reason, they never put the other clock in there. Uh, and of course, the dome, the cupola, right? All of these details are, you know, have bulbous rounded shapes on the upper half of it anyway. So it's got that and it's got it. inside, it's really ornate. But you can see some of the encrusted ornamentation or encrustation of ornamentation, even on the exterior, look, you know, at each corner and above the portico. So it's got that, it's got that feature. It's got all the Baroque features. The unseen presence, it, of course, it's a church would be God, right? And the, again, emotional component or emotional quality should be um, religious fervor or, or faith that you feel, supposedly. Now, you don't have to have seen the movie uh, Mary Poppins, right? to know that this is such a famous landmark that it once was, this is all part of the meaning, the tallest building in London for, for a long time, for over two centuries. And it's still considered one of the, the most famous landmarks in all of London. When it was built, it was by far the largest church north of Rome, the second largest, all part of the meaning. Again, I'll say it slowly. This was the second largest church in the world when it was finished. The only one bigger was the one in Rome, St. Peter's. It was deliberately designed to be one of the two biggest churches on earth. And the architect, Wren, was, oh, a genius. <laughs> uh, he designed hundreds of churches all over the British Isles and even a couple of buildings in the American colonies. He never went to the colonies, but his blueprints have been found. So some of the oldest buildings in uh, the former English colonies were by him. So he's a pretty important architect. He introduced the Baroque style to the British Isles. He had already done that before this building. That's why he was chosen as the architect, because Brit Britain had was behind the rest of England of uh, Europe. I mean, the Brits were a little behind uh, Italy and France and even Holland in choosing Baroque style architecture. But once they got into it, they did so in a big way. You can see this, is, like I said, it's the second biggest church ever built. Okay, but there's one other fact about the meaning, and then we'll do a quick form of analysis and, and talk about the, the uh, midterm. I'd like to show you this view. Do you notice something about these buildings here? Uh, do they look like they're the other buildings within a block, right, of the front entrance? There's the front that we were just looking at. How old do you think those buildings are? Not exactly, but do they look like they're Baroque? Uh, no, oh, they, they look no. pretty modern. Yes, they are. They're post-World War II, as are most of the buildings around St. Paul's Cathedral today. There's a few like from the 1800s, the Victorian here. Uh, now that's another Wren church. So somehow these two survive, but does anybody know why there are so many modern buildings in that part of London? Because the Blitz destroyed yeah. the majority yeah. of London around that area. You know your history. Yeah. I'll say it. Uh, yeah, you right? got it. You got it. Yeah. What happened is the Germans bombed. Now, just listen to the story and I'll summarize it. So then you'll be the last thing you can write about, need to write about the meaning on this last slide then before we start talking about the midterm. But this is not a minor point. This part of London was bombed nearly into rubble. Most, not obviously, but most of the buildings around St. Peter's were destroyed during the, and it was called the Blitz, you got, got that correct. You don't have to know that. You can say the German bombing of London, but the short way to say that is the one word, B-L-I-T-Z, and it's not a nightclub. <laughs> That's the Ritz with an R. The Blitz, okay, which the Germans were trying to bomb the Brits into surrendering. It didn't work, obviously, because of Churchill and all the other things the British, you know, resisted Hitler. 
But the most ironic thing is they were trying to destroy this church every time they sent, almost every time, over London anyway, bombers, you know, with hundreds, sometimes hundreds of bombers in one raid over London. They aimed at this church and they couldn't hit it. It went on for month after month. It was a year. The blitz lasted somewhere you know, between 1940 and maybe early 41. So it was nearly a year, many months. And then one time, right before that blitz, that bombing campaign, the German campaign to bomb London ended, one German bomb, 500 pounds, that's a big bomb, did penetrate the dome, went through the metal, that is metal here, uh, dome, yeah, outer dome, and went all the way into the floor of the church and buried itself in the crypt and did not explode. So the next day, this I love this. My dad and father had Life magazines from that period because he was a teenager during World War II. And then, of course, a young man fighting in the war in, in Europe. Anyway, so he had he had an issue of Life magazine from that that same week, you know, it was a weekly magazine. It's the biggest magazine in the world at that time with a black and white photo of the Churchill standing under the dome, looking up at the hole where you could see the sky, you know, the next day. And meanwhile, the fins of that bomb are, stand, are right below him. He was standing on the edge of the crater and he was smoking a cigar. If he dropped a cigar, into the, you never know, it might've blown everyone in the photo up sky high, but he had a message. And it was in the magazine, I think it was the caption of the photo. In any case, it was a propaganda line that was used. Eat this, Adolf, <laughs> meaning you're not going to bomb us into surrender. It's not working. And so guess what? Hitler called off the attempts to bomb this church. From that point on, they never tried to bomb it again because it was backfiring on them. Obviously, it didn't work. So you call that divine intervention, an act of God, an act of faith, a coincidence. But whatever it was, it helped the British morale. It didn't hurt it. And that's a fact you could look up easily. Okay, so uh, that's can I last... say something? Yeah, that, yeah, all that kind of sounds more like something that would happen in a cartoon. I know. Yeah, it doesn't sound like real life, does it? I right. know it does, or, or or a Marvel movie or something. But it really did. Uh, yeah, happen. right. Yeah, right. It did happen. Okay, so you could summarize it by saying that this was a target of the uh, German bombing during World War II, and they couldn't hit it until one last bomb penetrated the dome and buried itself in the, uh, you could say basement, but the right word is a crypt, and didn't explode. And that caused Hitler to call off the campaign because he was making it, him look, and the German Air Force look bad. <laughs> and of course, it helped the British morale, uh, obviously, until we finally got our act in gear and said, well, maybe we should do something. This guy, Adolf Hitler, doesn't sound like someone we want to just ignore. You know, we had plans to invade New York. You know, and they had aircraft carriers. If you guys don't write this, but th there's a lot more about the hidden history of World War II that you can see on documentaries, you know, on uh, History Channel or something. Yeah, he had, I think it was two aircraft carriers. It was enough. He was going to bomb New York from the sea if he defeated the Russians and the, and the British. His next target was us. So we were lucky the Brits held out as long as they did. Okay, formal analysis, we will do just that and then we'll get to, to talk about the test. It's completely symmetrical as most uh, architecture is. The largest mass is the dome, though from this angle, it doesn't look like it, but it really is massive. And then the second largest would be the upper towers because they were added at, la at the last part here. But you, if you want to call it the towers as a single mass, you could make the case that they might be the two largest mass because they're equal and then the dome. And then the porticos, each of these two column porches, right? Uh, then we have modeling is just the shadows from the sun. It's obviously cool. There's no warm colors here. Inside, there are a lot of warm colors, but not on the outside. It's a cool white marble. Uh, the texture is a real smooth texture of glass in the windows, real smooth marble, as I just said, and real smooth metal on the dome. For space, the dome is 330 feet high, or actually a little over 330 feet high. It's one large open domed room. Actually, there are smaller rooms, but just keep it simple. Say one, the main one is one large open domed space or room with a, about a 330 foot or slightly over 330 foot high dome above it. It's impressive to walk in there and look up at this. Uh, and then we have uh, the rhythm is obvious with the columns, 
the windows, the two towers, the same shapes. Um, let's see, line here is all visual. Well, there is some carved line, but you can't see it. So you could just ignore that and say that it's mostly the visual line created by the modeling, by the shadows around the edges of the uh, details here. Um, and then it is mostly stable, except for the tops of the clock towers. And of course, the entire dome itself, including the drum, that's called the drum, the bottom part. So that whole section is dynamic. Uh, but then below that, from the bottom of the towers down, the majority of the uh, facade is stable, uh, <clears throat> except for the tops of the windows. And let's see, am I forgetting anything? Textures, smooth, yeah, I think I covered everything. Uh, yeah, all right. Okay, so now we're gonna stop screen share and we're gonna go back to the main view here in which we are going to do a couple of things, but I'm gonna start by cutting the list. So if you guys will please take your syllabus, you should always have it with you, remember during each lecture and follow with me. I will go very slowly and repeat this once at the end. We're now gonna reduce the list of slides that you need to study uh, by at least 30%. So in order to do that, I do need to do it. Somebody wanna do it with me, that's fine. A, a, a count, a total count. And then I can do the math in my head that what's 30% of the total. And I'll probably cut it even more than that. So here's what we're gonna do the first six weeks. How many slides are there total before we start cutting? I think I have 48. Anyway, rounding up in your favor, because I said I cut at least 30% and probably more, uh, 48. Uh, 33 percent is a third, right? That obviously more than 30 percent. So if I cut a third, uh, that's 16 slides. Uh, uh, so let's do that at least, and I might end up cutting more. So I will cut a minimum of 16 slides as we go. So what we're doing is, again, you're taking your syllabus and you're following along with me with your pen and crossing out the ones I tell you to cross out. Okay, everybody, got that. So week one. Well, guess what? This is an easy one because. Uh, we're not going to cover these three topics there from the second half of the semester. I was just doing the introduction. So week one, we're going to cross three of them off and just leave the Libyan Sybil because that's Renaissance. So cross off, in other words, second, third, and fourth ones, the Luncheon on the Grass, Guernica by Picasso, and the Guggenheim Museum by Wright. Okay, so you're only leaving the Libyan Sybil by Michelangelo. Okay, moving on to week two. Let's see. Uh, the Church of San Lorenzo by Bruno Lesci. Okay. Um, and I'll cut Jacob and Esau. So the last two under week two, again, cross those off. Church of San Lorenzo and Jacob and Esau. Okay, week three. The Church of San Andrea, I know I'm kidding, but we have so many churches, right? The Church of San Andrea by Alberti is the third one on week three, cross that off. Uh, and I think I'm gonna cut The Tempest by Giorgione. Um, not that he's not important, but he isn't as famous as the other artists. So the last one under week three, The Tempest, cross that off. Okay, week four, I already cut the Tempietto, but if you didn't cross it out, do that now. It's part of the total reduction. We're not gonna cut the Michelangelo's or the Da Vinci's. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you, excuse me, can you repeat all that? <laughs> I'm gonna do it at the end. So why don't we do okay. this, keep going, and then I, I absolutely right. will repeat every one of them slowly one more time so you can follow. All right. So Sorry. for now, everyone, Luis and everyone, let's do week four. Tempietto, I don't know if you caught that. That's the third one down in week four by Bramante. Cross that out, okay? And then moving on down, um, I'm going to cross off. Oh, the return of the hunters. I don't even know if we even covered that. 
and then how about the crucifixion of the Eisenheim altarpiece? Cross that off. Uh, should cross, cross off at least one more. Um, hmm, this is a hard one. Um, hmm, Okay, I guess I'll cut off The Last Supper by Tintoretto. Okay, so again, for week four, and then I'll repeat all of them one more time before we start talking about how to study for Tint. Week four, there are four. You should cross off Tempietto by Bramante, Crucifixion of the Eisenheim Altarpiece, Return of the Hunters by Bruegel, and The Last Supper by Tintoretto. Okay, week five. Uh, I'm going to cross off the Church of San Carlo, even though it's an important one. I'm leaving the other one by Borromini, the third one down, cross off, because the slide is an old black and white slide, so it's hard to see the details. All right, so Church of San Carlo by Borromini, cross that off. Um, and then Garden of Love, Maids of Honor. Okay, we've got at least two. Judith and the Maidservant, cross that off. By Gentile she. Okay, now we're up to week six. All right. Um, as much as I like halls, we got to cut a few more. So La, the second one down under week six, La Boheme, Bohemian by Halls, cross that off. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and cross off the Hall of Mirrors of Versailles, because it's such a long, and you got more names, the two artists there. Yeah, so that gives you a break on that. The second from the bottom, the Hall of Mirrors of Versailles. Now, before I read you the final list, let me count and see, did I actually reach the total number of cuts that we were aiming for? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. No, we got to cut it at least uh, two more. Okay. So, yeah, I count at least 27 cuts. That's what I'm, wait, no, no, 27 pieces of art. That's what we have. Sorry. Left that. over. You mean left over, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that would mean that uh, if it had actually maybe, wait a minute, are you sure? No, actually, no, I'm. No, I don't think that's right. No, I, don't think right. I, I want to give you guys a maximum benefit. So let me do it again. I'll count it one more time. The ones we already did cross off, and then I'll add a few. I know we're short of our goal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So the minimum I have to cut is one more. And I'll see if I can figure out a way to cut more than that. Let's see. Um, Boy, I hate doing this. Let's see, but I'll cut it anyway. Villa Rotunda by Palladio, week four, okay? Week four, we have enough architecture slides. Villa Rotunda by Palladio, okay? So that brings it to 16. And uh, then let's see if I might cut two more, then that reduces the total down to uh, 30. And that's not bad for you to only have to study 30. If you go to UC Berkeley or... A Cal State, Sonoma State, you'll, in art history, you'll have hundreds of slides. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, It's actually 47 slides. So if I cut one more, we're down to 30 and that's a nice round number. So let's cut one more. Okay. Um, uh, boy. I'm gonna cut the Jewish bride because we have two Rembrandts. All right, week six, the Jewish bride by Rembrandt. We'll leave the night watch, that's really important. All right, we are down to 30. I cut it by more than a third, like 35%. So I hope that, that's helpful to you. So I'll say them all one more time, like I promised. Okay, just follow me quickly because we want to get to the other parts of the... Uh, we have to cut the list of terms to know too in a similar manner. And then I'll tell you how the slide... I'm going to show you an example of the test, actual printout of it, and tell you how to study for it. Okay, here we go. Follow me. 
slowly one more time. Here's the total list of slides you should have crossed out. Week one, there are three. Luncheon on the Grass, Guernica by Picasso, and the Guggenheim Museum by Wright. Week two, there are two more. The Church of San Lorenzo by Brunelleschi and Jacob in the South by Giberti. Week three, there are two more. You cut. The Church of San Andrea and Giorgione, The Tempest. Okay, week four. Tempietto by Bramante. So it's four you're cutting on week four. Then the next one is Crucifixion of the Eisenheim Altarpiece. Actually, it's five. Return of the Hunters by Bruegel. Villa Rotunda by Palladio, and The Last Supper by Tintoretto. Week five, you're cutting two. Judith and the Maid Servant by Gentileschi, and The Church of San Carlo by Borromini. And then three on week six, La Bohemienne by Halls, The Jewish Bride by Rembrandt, and The Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Okay, so now take the next handout that you should always have with you each week as we go through them. And we're going to cross out, let's see how many terms that I give you to know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, it's 14, 14. So that's good. So let's cut at least four. That would bring it down to only 10. And that's not very many for you to have to study. Okay, uh, I'm gonna cut, let's see. Sheriff, okay, let's page one of the list of terms to know. Leave fresco, because that's gonna come up somehow, but Sheriff, you can cross out the definition of it. Um, okay, moving on down the page. Um, bow relief, you can cut up bow relief. Okay, moving on to the second page. We've only come to the second page. Mannerism, you can cross that out. And then we should cut one more. Um, well, okay, I think I, I try to make it the, the more complicated, cut one more of the most complicated ones. You should know what a triptych is. Oh, secular, secular, there we go, secular. All right, I'll say it again. So that reduces to 10, and that's as low a list, short a list as I've ever had. Uh, so cross off Sherub, bow relief, secular, and mannerism. But you will need to know the others, the last one of which we've been on for two weeks, the four main features of broke art. Okay, any questions on the reduction of the list of terms to know? Because it'll make sense to you in just a minute if, uh, if you're not clear how those terms might appear on the midterm I'm going to explain that right now but just to make sure everybody got those four that you cut now okay so here we go here is how the test is going to look and how you're going to take it um I have to be you know somewhat let's see if I can you see that's the midterm you can do this as a pdf if you have and most of you do the app that allows you to edit a PDF, you can then type in your answers, but you don't have to. You can write them in on the sheet. So what's the first section after you put your name? Don't forget to mention which class you're in, of course. Um, it's easy. The class here is uh, <clears throat> Tuesday, 6.30 and 9.30, and the date, of course. The exam is going to be given a week from today. So obviously, that is the 9th of March. Here we go. The first part. You'll get a copy of the test before, just uh, not two days before, because you don't shouldn't start working on it that, but uh, several hours before the test. So you can look for it certainly uh, after, oh, say, uh, four o'clock. I'll send you an email, I'll remind you of this next Tuesday. So then before you log in, you will have seen the test and it'll be in front of you. If I were you, I'd print it out. If you're going to write it by hand, your answers, of course, then you should print it out because you're gonna see these slides on the screen and here's how they'll be shown. All right, I'll say this and repeat it, say it slowly. The first part is slide identification. Okay, that means you identify each of the first five slides that you see posted 
on my Zoom midterm section, the session, sorry, just like they are on the syllabus by their title, the location or the artist, usually it's the artist that's given, right? And, and this, because we know the name of the artist and then the date, but you can round your date to a zero, right? In other words, if it's 1453, you could say 1450. Okay, so once again, you give the same facts that are on the syllabus about that slide, once you, uh, you recognize it, the title, or the artist and the date, but you can round the date to a zero. That's worth three points for each correct fact. And then you need to analyze each of, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, it's here. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Yes, I had it right. I'll say it again, I apologize. This section is worth three points for each correct fact. And there's three facts about each slide, right? There's the title, the artist, and the date. And you see they're numbered here, slide one. I'll hold it up again and give you guys long enough if you want to take a screenshot but you'll have a few hours to look at this and then you'll have days afterwards to go back to it if you choose to to you know complete your answers add to them or even uh change them okay since it's an open book test okay so you would print neatly please if you're writing please don't give me cursive people tell you even since third grade your cursive was the best any student in there in your third grade teacher class ever had it's not always easy to read someone else's cursive. So if you don't mind, if you're hand printing your answers, filling them in by hand, please print as neatly as you can. And not tiny. Some people have tiny printing. That's hard to read. Okay. Uh, but of course, it's not that hard. I mean, it's easy if, if, if you're typing them in on a, um, an app that allows you to edit a, a PDF. So either, either method is acceptable. Okay. So you're going to end up with Three facts for each of five slides. Well, you can do the math. Three points, if you get all three facts right, for the first slide, you just got nine points. There are five of these slide identifications. So five times nine is 45. So you see what happens. In the first section, you got nearly half the total. The point, the possible points here is, the total is, is 100, if you got a perfect score. Okay. And yeah, you email me this test through my uh, AOL account at Mark W at AOL, of course. That will be on the template. It'll be the it'll say midterm art 1.1 midterm template, and that's what you should print out before you log on uh, uh, at 6:30 next Wednesday. I will give you guys a few extra minutes because I know some people can't get there right. So we're around six. 45 is when I'll put the first slide on. I'll say all this in an email to you as a, as a reminder, but that gives you a few minutes to, you know, get home, catch your breath, get a cup of coffee, look over your notes, get situated. Um, and I might be telling you some some news. I might, I will have some news next week for extra credit, another extra credit option. I'll do that before I actually put the first slide up. So at 645, you want to be signed in before that so that you have all your stuff by 640 would be good. Okay, so that's the first part. The next part is true false. Now, this, some of you noticed, is the midterm for Art 1.1. It's exactly the same format. I don't reinvent the wheel for each class, but as you may already be able to guess or figure out, the definitions are not the same because that's an ancient, that class is ancient art history. So, the true false section is where the definitions will come up, but they won't be these. That's why I feel comfortable showing you that obviously you're not being tested on the ancient pyramids. You're being tested on Renaissance and Baroque art. So there will be five uh, statements that will either be based on those definitions on the right ones I gave in class, the list of terms, the 10 now that are left. You would then decide, is that statement true or false? And all I have to do is write a T or an F. That's all. Each of these is worth two points, right? So there's another 10 points there if you get them all right. And then last, I'll hold this, keep this steady. So if you want to take a screenshot, uh, the part that'll take you the longest, 15 minutes for each of three short essays, which are three slides that will stay on the screen for 15 minutes each. Now, if you need extra time, you've got it with the way this test is going to be posted on YouTube. I'll probably try to do that by Thursday for this class because you take it on Tuesday. So within 
you know, a few hours, a day and a half, you'll have the test posted. It'll stay there till Saturday. You'll have two full more days to look it over in the recorded version and go back and check your answers. It's, it's really the least stressful possible way of taking an exam, but you should study for it. So what are these worth? Well, on these three short essays, you start by analyze, I'm sorry, by ident I misspoke, identifying the slides on the first line, as it says right there, if you're reading along with me, right? Uh, and those facts on this section are only worth one point each. So even if, you don't get them right, you then have 12 more points possible in two short paragraphs. And I wrote it right out here. Again, I'll get closer. You can see that more easily. What do I mean by that? Well, the two short paragraphs should be six sentences each, six facts about the meaning, each one in a sentence, and keep them separate, just like you should have on your papers. And then six of the nine elements, you don't have to give me all nine, that you see on this slide, you know, color, uh, you know, modeling, texture, what have you, dynamic versus stable. And don't forget, I'll remind you of this during the test, uh, you need to give an example of each of those six elements that you're describing. If you do all that correctly, and you know, you identified the slide on the top line correctly, you have 15 points, there are three of those, you can do the math, but if, if it's too late for that, I'll do it for you. Three times 15, if you get all three right, is another 45. So there's your 100 points. The first section, identification, is 45 points. Then 45 for this, the short essays, if you get everything right. Plus, if you get all the uh, true false right, another 10, that adds up to 100 points exactly, which is the maximum score, of course, for a perfect test. Now, just so you can see, I, I will send you, you know, uh, this you know, extra page. So if you are actually writing physically on this, you could just fill it in there again. Remember, please use ink too, by the way, the pencil is hard to read. It's, it's usually too light, but you can uh, just, uh, you can write on the back if you choose to, but I don't think most of you would need to do that unless you have very large handwriting, but you can, if you want to, you can, you can, or you can add a page at the end. Uh, but remember, it has to be sent back to me in the format I'm sending it to all of you, which is as a PDF. Now I see there's a chat thing here. Let me see what this is. Did anybody have questions? Because um, oh, that just, was from before, yeah. Uh, just one. Oh yeah, questions now, any questions? Go ahead. So in previous classes, I've had similar um, essays, like short essays on tests before. And it's just like, choose one of three subjects and write a short essay on that. Is it going to be something similar to that? Or is it going to be three slides? No, straight three up slides and short essays on those three. That's it. Three slides from the syllabus, the remaining 30 that are there. So in other words, you're being tested on eight slides. They won't be the same. The slide applications will be five different slides. And that's fairly quick, right? Those will only be on this. Well, I'll give you uh, Two minutes is more than enough time on each one. Believe me, either you'll know them and you'll do them in 20, 30, 40 seconds, but I'll leave them up for two minutes each. And then uh, 15 minutes each to uh, do the short essays. And then we are gonna have a new topic. Don't forget that, don't disappear after the test during the break, you know, catch your breath and then think about, well, do I need to go back and redo this? Well, you have all the time you need until Saturday if you want to look at it on the YouTube again. But the second half, we're going to start on art of, um, let's see, you know what? I think it's India. Yeah, it is. Pretty sure that's right. So, so I'll remind you of that fact. That Remember, this is a world art class. Yes, it is. It's uh, uh, South Asian, which means India and Pakistan. And no, actually, Southeast Asia. Oh, Burma's coming up. Yeah, boy, those people are really going through a lot right now. Uh, I've only ever known one person from Burma, and I'll bet she went back there, so I hope she's safe. Anyway, so so in other words, we, we, this test, the whole thing should take you uh, not more than an hour, but if you need more time, you've got it. It's built into the format of having the whole test available at your beck and call on the internet, on YouTube, by, let's say, 7 p.m. Thursday. So then you have Friday and Saturday, 48 hours. And I'll accept it up till midnight on Saturday. So it's even more than 48 hours. I have a quick question about yes. the paper. 
So yeah, I have seven pages, including my work cited and my eighth page is my picture. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. That's sort of the uh, upper limit, but but I'm not going to take points off if it was longer. Sounds like you really picked a topic you're excited about. or, or Yeah, I, I tried to put as, as <coughs> much as I could that made sense and then take out as much that was fluff. Just curious, what fluff. subject was it? Yeah, uh, It was uh, a manga, a Japanese comic. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I'm familiar with, so, well, it depends on, it has been a lot of, uh, Yukio, you know, that mm. somewhat controversial depending on the theme artists that I've seen papers from. Anyway, whatever you chose is fine as long as it sounds like you had plenty of research materials to choose. Right. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Thank that's you. about the upper limit I would ask people to keep to. Seven actual type pages of the text is more than uh, is plenty. If you go to 10, you kind of it's overkill. But that's fine. No problem. Any any other questions uh, about the papers or what I just told you about the midterm. So in other words, you should study, but you don't need to stress out over it because if you know you, you didn't get some notes, you missed a class, as I said to Luis and several other, anybody, everybody's the same thing for all of you, is you have that option to go back and look at the lectures the way they, they are, they were given and you know pause them and take more detailed notes if you want. But you know now there are 18 of these slides you don't even have to think about. We just crossed out. So only the 30 that are remaining, out of which eight you'll be tested on. So remember the three slide essays are three different slides, not from the list of slide identifications. So it's eight different slides that you'll be seeing during the course of the test. Okay, any other questions now about, uh, again, anything relating to or extra credit. I think I'll wait till next week to, to, to make an announcement. It should be definite by then. Well, you know what? Might be before then. I may send you an email. I have got a piece coming out in the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. That's the longest uh, essay they published of mine. They published about four pieces of mine. It has to do with the school renaming controversy, but it's broader than that about history and context and what is and isn't reasonable and who should and shouldn't or shouldn't be honored with their name on a public building, not just schools, but you know any public uh, edifice. It's a topic that's current, right? You may have heard about the school district in San Francisco removing Lincoln's name from a building. And then, then they got blowback. So who knows, they might not end up doing it. And there's such controversy right there in Santa Rosa. I started to say here, but I'm in Berkeley. Uh, there's, there's a controversy over James Monroe School and there's two schools in after Lincoln. So, so it's a local angle. And when that comes out, you get extra credit if you send me a screenshot or PDF of that article, or if you buy a copy of the actual newspaper, I'll put this in an email. Once I know, they haven't picked a date yet. It might be published after the midterm, but if it's before, I'll send you an email. And it'd be 10 points if you actually give me a hard copy and just mail it to me, because that is only the, sh the page it's on. I don't need the whole paper. Uh, I can't get that down here in Berkeley. They don't have the Santa Rosa paper here. If I was up there, it'd obviously be easy. Okay, so I'll, that'll be a new extra credit option. I'll mention it at the start of class next week because their online edition is posted for weeks after the, the piece, if it came out before the test. So I'm going to see all of you guys, hopefully between 6.30 and 6.40. <laughs> no later than that, hopefully you, you should log in. And the test will start at 6.45. And you'll get a reminder of that by email, as well as the test itself, uh, the day of the test. But So check your inbox after about, uh, or to be safe, say five. It depends on how much other email uh, traffic I have that day. Tuesday, the day of the test, you'll see it there. Uh, and it should just take you, you know, it's only two or three pages, less than 30 seconds to print it out. All right, any other questions about anything? test or papers all right uh thank you all for your time yeah. and your oh sorry is there a question I, I didn't i didn't get all the crossed out uh, slides yeah well rather than go back over the whole list and take 10 minutes it's on the video of this which is going to be posted uh no later than friday at 7 p.m which gives you like four days to look at it Okay. okay, because it took us a while to do that. But uh, I can just tell you this, it leaves you with 30 left over instead of 48, which gives you a decent reduction 
of things you you do need to study. So you'll 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 be able to do that easily when you watch the video. It's remember it's the second half. I don't know how much you saw of the lecture if you just joined us late or not, but it's in the last half after the break that we cover what's on the test. So that's the part you want to watch over again, or you know for the first time. Okay, I hope that helps. All right, because uh, yeah, it is almost nine thirty. But I will answer any other straight single shot type questions about anything relating to the class if there are any others before we sign off anybody else i do okay. yes okay oh Luis. yeah right yeah, yeah. Oh. well after you would turn off the recording <laughs> oh uh yeah all right i'll do that pause the recording <laughs>